Welcome back. My name is Kit. I'm Alex. And I'm Steve. And this is Streaming Things with a very special episode, a patron demanded review of Scream from 1996. The beloved Scream. Suggested to us by patron Matthew Amerson. So thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. And the reason I'm so excited for this conversation, uh, we just did our horror movie villain draft. I hope you had fun with that on Monday. Um, I know we did. Steve has never seen Scream before. Scream? Scream. You guys want to watch Scream? Scream. Scream was uh, vital to my upbringing, like many of the patron demanded. I mean, the, the, you guys are on the pulse of my my 90s movies. Uh, we're actually reviewing uh, The Faculty this week on the Patreon as well. Very excited for that. Which Alex pointed out. He texts me, oh, two Kevin Williamson screenplays. Just double dipping, man. I didn't even realize that. Yeah. Because the Scream was chosen by Matthew, what, six, nine months ago? Yeah, earlier this year. Yeah. yeah. And the, the Faculty was just randomly voted upon for the September poll. So the fact that we're talking about two Kevin Williamson movies this week was so not planned. And the fact that you could talk about three if you guys did a special Teaching Mrs. Tingle episode. <laughs> That's true. That was on the list and we just couldn't squeeze it in. Just not, I know what you did last summer. <laughs> so this episode was just supposed to be, and I hope I'm not spoiling anything, but I think this setup is so funny. This episode was supposed to be Steve and I, because Alex was going to do the horror movie villain draft. He's got things Correct. to do today. He was going to leave. He saw Steve's rating on Letterboxd. <laughs> I, and I don't want to just me, highlight Steve <laughs> and text me and said, OK, I got to be there. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> you know, because this movie is generally beloved. I could I could safely say that. Yeah. Right. Generally and generationally. Yeah. When Wes Craven came out with this movie and, mm -hmm. and I was only eight years old, mm -hmm. so I actually didn't understand the satire aspect sure. of it. It was one of the first horror movies that I had seen. Yeah. So I didn't understand any of the references that it was making. But watching it in my 30s. I'm like, oh, fuck, yeah, in a, in a, in a totally different way. Mm -hmm. But I love that it works as the thing it's mocking as yeah. well. Just perfectly yeah. fine. It's a yeah. serviceable slasher horror movie in and of itself. Um, but Steve, talk a little bit about not your overall thoughts yet. Okay. But talk about your letterbox rating. <laughs> I didn't realize my letterbox rating would get me in so much. Well, you water. are on trial, sir. As as a, Jesus. As a letterbox can I, can can I as a letterbox lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> no. It's you're, me and I, you're fucked. You're, <laughs> Miranda done, ain't got shit to say here. Uh, <laughs> as a letterbox girly, I think it's fascinating. Like you're you would say you're pretty stingy with the stars, I think, right? I just have a different star rating than most people, I guess. I didn't think my starting was that bad. Well, I feel like for me, and I think I'm correct. <laughs> like a two out of five is something that kind of actively pisses me off. Okay. It's a movie that I'm like, his three is kind of my baseline where it's like, mm -hmm. you made a movie, you mm -hmm. finished it. That's impressive. I watched the whole thing. Good for you. I had a decent enough time. I'll never think about it again. I might not unless I revisit it and have a different take because sure. I've grown as a person or whatever, right? Like a just different perspective, but generally two or below is like, fuck this movie. Yeah. Fuck it in its face. Uh -huh. uh, and so to, to do that to scream, I know you don't agree that that's what a two means. Mm -hmm. But like, at least on my scale. In sure. my mind, two out of five is objectively four out of ten. And if you get a 40 percent on a test, you fucking well, miserably failed. That's and, the way I think of it, you know. And so and that's where if we if we want before we get into like the scream, we want to get into like review culture, I guess. <laughs> and uh, stars, though, they're, they're bullshit. They're, they're, they're so, arbitrary. There's so right? much that is just there's so much. I I want to say trauma, but I'm definitely over inflating the word. But like trauma attached to be due to like the public school grading system. Right. Where if you're like, yeah, people see a seven out of ten, like that's a 70. That's a C. But. You know, and like, the, no, like seven, like seven is three and a half out of five. That's good, whatever. But like, if you look and this is where I kind of see where Steve is coming from, where if you look at everything as like a bell curve, where it's, you know, you have like your end, which is your zero, scoops up into the middle, comes back down to five stars or out of 10, however you want to do it. Sure. Most of everything you watch, if you watched every movie under the it's fucking gonna sun, two, three, or four. it's going to fall under two and a half because that's just the center of the curve. And most things are average. And that's what an average is. Uh. So. See, and that's what kind of alerted me, what made my red flags go off seeing Steve's two stars. Because I'm just like, even in a bell curve sense, this is pissing me off. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, this is still below average by how I do things. Like, oh, no. I do like, you're right. Like, the analogy falls flat with a seven being 70. 
You're yeah, right. Because that's not, not the case at all. Seven is good. I, I get pissed off. A lot of people will get offended if you mark their favorite movie a three and a half. Again, and because they out. can't read. I say this every episode <laughs> I'm on. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Because I mean, three and a half is, is, is a stellar rating, but yeah. a lot of people don't see it that way. I think three and a half. I give movies three and a half sometimes if they spell their name right on the cover. I just think objectively <laughs> two is very low. Two is yeah. I, two, two to me is below average. Yeah. Like I don't go tossing out twos. But can we all agree? Agree that if we were rating this movie on the Morbius scale, this would be more than Morbius. Yes, it'd be more Morbius, right? Yeah. 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 As do you, a, do as you a, remember the Morbius scale? I, I, yeah. I, 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 there's so a guy who rates movies. So you, yeah. you, you know Kyle uh, Breitenstein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at work, he rates movies. He doesn't do a star rating. He doesn't do that shit. He has a Morbius scale <laughs> okay. where a more to him the movie Morbius. So when he's Morbius, is like. You've done the bare minimum it takes to make a movie. Like functionally, by the definition of what makes a movie, you yeah. have done it. You were Morbius. So he rates movies. Is this more than Morbius or less than more Morbius? Nice. Or Morbius. Yeah. So <laughs> this movie is a more than Morbius. Uh-huh. There's there's another podcast I have some friends listen to, but my wife also kind of subscribes to the same scale where it's uh it's broken out as worst movie ever, just a movie, best movie ever. So it's like a one five ten, mm-hmm. and I'm like, that's a really solid way to break things out because I mean, like most things are going to fall under one of those camps. Like in like movie review plinko with like three categories, I feel like that's like where the chips are going to fall. You know, it's just like worst, yeah. okay, best. Like, but at the same time, there's very little nuance to that. There's sure. no scalpel, right? But if and the Morbius if, scale is very cynical. <clears throat> like I get yeah, it. Yeah. Satir- yeah. It satirizes the the concept of ratings in general, which I like because sure. they're bullshit and arbitrary, and people. These days, because of Rotten Tomatoes specifically, but also even Who's Letterboxd. Robert Tomatoes? Have, <laughs> they've gamified art in yeah. a way that's mm-hmm. gross. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it's attaching a number or a grade to it. Yeah. Really, the, the And those things the fluctuate depth over time. Review. Like People comment on my Letterbox all the time. They'll be like, why did you give Underwater five stars or something like that? And yeah. I'll just say, because they're fake. They're bullshit and I have fun and I love yeah. that movie. It's all that means, right? Yeah. right. But why I give Scream, Scream a four and Scram? a half. Scram. Yeah. <laughs> I give Scram because I'm from LA. A four and a half. Yeah. Scram. Uh, I, I love this movie. I think it's great. Yeah. I don't think it's perfect. It, it just doesn't. And it's few, only. Few movies are. It, exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. it. That's people, it. People who justify like their reviews are like, it's not perfect. It's like, fuck you. What is? Well, like, the there's o- like seven movies. The only I've difference seen like that one. between a four and a half and a five star movie is my own cowardice. Yeah. And and <laughs> and calling it a five. That's it. There's yeah. a certain there's that's a certain fair. I call it the five star lean. Mm-hmm. And like, that's when I know like how long I'm doing the five star lean kind of lets me know like how long is this going to be? a five-star thing and it's very much just like this <laughs> yeah and like the longer i'm in this like acute angle bend the more i'm like okay like i'm i'm here i, I may end i might be like i don't know what i just watched but i did not break the bend i gave five violent stars. night the david harbour santa claus yeah. movie of five stars because i wanted to call it citizen candy cane in my review oh geez that's literally it <laughs> <laughs> i love that you, and you're mad at me for my star <laughs> flinging no, i was gonna say because like i uh sydney lumet's murder on the orient express I, I had watched recently and i was so ready to be like i cannot wait for my review to say like more like murder on the Orient express <laughs> but like it ended and i went fuck i liked that yeah <laughs> like damn it it's like, i can't use my cynical reviews on the orient. <laughs> love that that's you, a great. You, you plan your puns in advance. Sometimes they pan out. Sometimes, sometimes they, they don't. don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, Alex and I are here to to gush on this movie, mm-hmm. but not shit on Steve. I want to be clear. I'm being. I'm poking fun. I uh, uh, I wholly subscribe <laughs> to love what you love, <laughs> and uh, art is subjective. Should I explain my rating? You yes. Okay. I just want to be clear <laughs> up front that like uh, the dunking on you is a joke. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you habeas know, review bus. Come on, let's do there's this. A, there's a quite a few masterpieces that I just <laughs> don't connect with. Famously, I didn't like Vertigo that much. You know, I get a lot of shit for that. So I, I, I'm, I'm on your side. But it did surprise me. We were on the phone. I said, Steve, great news. I know you're very busy. You're stressed at work. We're reviewing the faculty and scream this week. I know you've not you've never seen either. Mm-hmm. They're both great, fun mm-hmm. movies. Mm-hmm. And last night at midnight, I checked my letterbox. Steve didn't like either one. And I was like, <laughs> oh, no, no. Sad. <laughs> <laughs> no, here's the thing. I actually really I actually had fun with the faculty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like the faculty more. I can't give it more than two and a half stars because I think it's just a We'll get to that review yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. But so my the the way my scaling it scaling goes on my reviews are a five stars is a is a perfect movie. And mm-hmm. like you said, the only thing keeping a four and a half from a five is my own cowardice. Usually I reserve the five star for like, okay, it's been 10 years. You deserve to be a five. Yeah. Here we go. I still feel strongly about you. 
A four star is a great movie. Like this is a movie that I think is exceptional. Yeah. A three star is a good movie. Like, oh, I like that. Yeah. yeah. I like that. I had fun. A two star is like, eh, not, not really for me. And a one star is fuck this movie. Mm-hmm. I hate it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause there's a, I'm one of those people where I'm like, okay, you got me. You got me. Fuck you. Like there's no real, like Michael Keaton, white noise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's real there's not really a, a gradient between i hate this and eh, to me yeah. right it, it, it's a very steep drop so mm-hmm. that's why one is like i hate this two is like not for me um but yeah that's that's how my review get but i gave i gave scream a two out of five star well it's and definitely very I, much not I for you so i, I, get I that. had a yeah. visceral reaction at 605 in the morning when i saw it <laughs> <laughs> i just think it was so funny because we watched i watched it with erica last night and i, I rated it and within like moments Within moments, people in the Discord, like Ruben on the Discord, is like, oh, fuck, can't wait for this. <laughs> and, it, and then Chris is texting me and like, oh, Alex is on the show now because you gave it two stars. I'm like, I did not expect it. It was, it, was the, it, it was the divisiveness of seeing like what you gave it, like a four and a half. Yeah. And then you just like a cold two, you know, <laughs> just like it, he, you, you wrote your like your, your Stone your, Cold your, Masterpiece. Uh, yeah, yeah, you wrote your one line and then and you were just like. Two. <laughs> I sleep now beautifully and deeply. I don't write reviews on Letterbox. I just I, I don't blame I, you. I just give the star. Yeah. I don't even give like a title. I'm just like, good. You're yeah. lucky. Because that yeah. way you can avoid comments on your yeah, screen I review. Want, I don't want that shit. Nobody don't care. I would say nobody comments on Letterbox unless you got like five thousand followers. <laughs> Kit laser over here. Right. <laughs> I just think it was uh really funny that I woke up because I asked Alex, hey, can you stick around for the scream? Uh, review you know yeah. Yeah. and he said no absolutely not I've i said got, normally i would i got a busy day man i can't and it was a hard no and i was like ah, that's fair and then this morning he's like i just saw steve's review i will be seated <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I had to, it was one of those where i'm like i could wait and listen to this but then i feel like i'm gonna be mad in my cubicle yeah you know if i wasn't sitting there going like if I'm sitting there at work going, no, 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 <laughs> no. And then all I'd be thinking about is like, I had my fucking chance. I could have, you know, whatever. But like, yeah. yeah. So Steve. I, I wouldn't be here for it. You start us off with your overall thoughts. What it was it like yeah. watching this? Unless you don't want to start. But well, I, I usually start. start with you. I can start. Um, your overall thoughts on Scream 1996. Uh, and then we'll go we'll go around the table here. So, and then we'll do a play by play, scene by scene, spoiler filled review. So my overall I, uh, before I get into my overall thoughts, I do need to drop that caveat that longtime listeners will know. I'm not a big horror movie person in general. Like it takes a very exceptional horror film for me to like, like it. Like I'm yeah. very picky with my choices on what speaks to me. Cause a lot of these movies, it's just not my jam. I, I can't really, really quite explain why they're not my jam. They're just not, they're just not to, to set a barometer. What would you call your, like your kinds of horror movies? If you could rattle up like two, I mean, it, it typically they, they skew more towards like monster sci-fi type sure. horror. Like yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. the things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, we reviewed uh, American Psycho not too long ago. And mm. I, even I was like, this is like an exception, not a rule for me. Cause usually mm. slasher movies specifically are the ho- types of horror I identify the least with. Sure. Like I, the ho- like slasher movies are the ones where I'm like, I could not do with those. Like, they, they just don't interest me. Mm. I think it's the combination of like, I think teenagers are annoying in general. Mm. So, seeing, <laughs> see, so seeing movies that are pl- where 40 year olds are playing teenagers, like I, it's just not for me. Right. And um, so going into this movie, I, I and, and, and I think the real reason why there's two stars on that review is because I'm watching this movie at the wrong time. I think if I watched this movie in 1996 mm-hmm. when it was brand new and genre breaking and m- defining, I would probably have that nostalgic like, oh, I love this. This changed the way I view uh, horror films it changed how i view slasher films i love the meta commentary on it uh because back then it's such a novel idea right mm-hmm. yeah meta isn't very novel th- almost 30 years removed right right uh but it's one of those things where as i'm watching i'm like okay i understand why this is such a big deal this is very different than what was happening around this time i get it mm-hmm. why it's on this pedestal at the same time, it's just not the type of movie for me. So the, sure. the love letter it's writing to all these other horror films, like I don't really care about those movies either. I kind of wish more of the love letters were less name droppy and more like the janitor wearing the Freddy Krueger outfit in this really weird cutaway. Like that, that, that made me laugh. I'm like, yes, that's funny. Yeah. I love this. More of that, please. Sure. Um, 
but I mean, like in general, like I think the meta stuff is what works best for me, actually. Yeah. Like there's a scene where Jamie Kennedy and Matthew Lillard and friends are just on the couch and they're yelling at the, they're watching a horror movie and they're yelling at the screen and Mm -hmm. there's like a 30 second delay between what them and Kenneth are seeing in the van. Is his name Kenneth or Kenny? Kenny. Kenny. Kenny His mother calls him Kenneth. Yeah. (laughs) yeah. His his Christian name is Kenneth. Uh, And I I really thought that was cool. Like the 30 second delay stuff. I thought that was really fun. That was my most, that was the favorite part of the movie for me was that stuff. But then some of the other things were just kind of like, yeah, I like this. It's fun. Sure. Yeah, sure. I like this. It's just, it's kind of like going to a football game for me where like the whole time I'm like, everyone's having a good time. I'm happy they're having a good time. Oh, he, he moved for three feet. Everyone seems to be happy about that. Yeah. I'm happy for just everybody want both else to have fun. I kind of want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's, and, and, and that's why I'm glad Alex is on here because like, this isn't even like a fucking Godzilla versus Kong situation where I can just fucking rip this apart and not feel bad about it and like make fun of it. This is just kind of like a, yeah, this happened. Like, yeah, I will make fun about how often Ghostface Pratt falls in this movie because it is, I don't think Ghostface is a scary villain. No. Period. Uh, he, it, it's more funny. Like there's a couple scenes where like the camera will linger on the woods and he goes, he, he, and he just kind of like runs into frames. Yeah. It's about. fucking hilarious. Yeah. It's, I, and I don't, I don't think it's supposed to be scary. It's funny. Yeah. It's supposed um, to be funny. Okay. But yeah, you don't hire Jamie Kennedy and Matthew Lillard in your serious, scary movie. You I know, do, I do wish someone would have pulled Matthew Lillard aside and said, like, hey, man, can you take it down from an 11 to maybe a 10? No, it's going to be so mad at me. No, oh, the, the killer reveal. Love that. Yeah. Everything before the killer reveal. I'm like, OK, this guy's definitely either the killer or mm. he's going to be the first one murdered. Oh, he's not the first one murdered. He's the killer. Yeah. <laughs> Did you call it for real? Yeah. Well, and this is the unfortunate thing. It's an almost 30 year old movie. Sure. I knew there sure. were two, two people. You're yeah. Right. Right. So I knew, I knew that going in. So the whole time it was just kind of like, okay, Matthew Lillard's probably one of them. It was, it was trying to figure out who the other one was. Like, I think it'd be too obvious if it's Jamie Kennedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, she forgave Billy pretty quickly. It's probably Billy. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but I don't know if I would have come to that conclusion if I didn't know there were two killers going into it. So yeah, yeah. again, this is, that was this, a twist. Is, this is the problem with reviewing a movie that's like older, that is like genre defining, but like everything since has like adopted what this movie did first. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's hard to like really kind of connect with it in that way. Than when someone when, who saw it when it first came out did, especially when you're, you're raised kind of, you know, cause you were super saying like eight, seven, eight, nine, you know, mm-hmm. when, when scream came out and you see something that's so groundbreaking that then becomes parodied so often. It's like the, the matrix. When yeah, I, I watched the matrix, the same with, it was same with like bullet time. It's the same with like how many star Wars parodies they're same with like people parodying, uh, the seventh seals, things like that, where you like, you watch these things now and you're like, eh, I've seen this made fun of so many times. Like I can see where that would like kind of diminish the return of, of watching mm-hmm. it for the first time mm-hmm. for sure. Have you, have you seen scary movie? Oh, I've seen scary movie way more than this. So it's yeah. funny because I'm like, okay, I know someone dies in a doggy door. Oh, it was a cat door. Yeah. How fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say, it might make you appreciate the Wayans Brothers works a lot more now that you're seeing, like, the main movie they were mocking was Scream. Mm-hmm. Um, you really probably come around on your opinion on white chicks now. Yeah. <laughs> it's about time. Right. It's about or the time. Long Wayans brother. revisionist history. Yeah. yeah. It's major about time. pain. Right. Oh, major um, pain's so good. <laughs> but not you really. tell you the story about but the t- little engine it could but tell me what what why this movie speaks so much to you guys i'm really more excited about that i, I honestly as as uh as vocal as i was in my shock i i think i'm probably more in the middle i actually don't even know how alex feels about the movie but mm-hmm. as far as how i know most people feel about the movie um you know that as far as horror goes typically andy would be seated there yes diehard horror fan i'm in the middle And then you're not really a horror fan. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I feel about Scream. The reason I didn't like horror movies as a kid, I've thought about this a lot recently because I'm really into them now. Mm -hmm. Um, I wasn't that I was like super scared. But I think I was more than I wanted to admit. But like the ending of most horror films, it's like they they defeat the villain, the antagonist. And 99% of the time there is some kind of resurgence of the villain to remind you just it's only because they want a sequel. And so at the end, like final destination or something, it will just all the happy ending stuff is taken out of the window and it's shit storm for them. Cue credits. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm always a bummer. It's yeah. And it's kind of, I'm not a bummer guy. 
uh, where I'm like, oh, I wanted her to just be happy and just live, you know? Um, so most franchise horror annoys me for that reason because there's like, sense. there's really no resolution to anything yeah. from a story perspective. It just seems bad. Right. But I'm able to appreciate practical effects, gnarly mm -hmm. kills. Uh, I love societally, I think horror functions as a, a, a very useful tool mm -hmm. uh, to combat uh, uh, like a puritanical American roots, like the, the whole idea that, um, like in this movie talks about it, how, you know, sex and, and sin, things like that are punished mm -hmm. in horror films. I, I find that inherently fascinating. I think the intersection of, uh, of sexuality and death, it, like, cause most horror movies are kind of sexy. You know very, what I mean? Like yeah. there's a very tight relationship. Especially in the slasher genre. They're very sexploitative. Yeah. In and a certain I, way. I find that fascinating. So uh, there's a lot to, to, to dive into and love nowadays uh, as an adult about horror. But anyway, all that aside, I did love scream as a kid, you know, um, this is my early introduction to, I, I hate to say it, but I, I saw Drew Barrymore in this before I did in like ET or anything else, you know? And probably Charlie's Angels in full throttle before ET. <laughs> like that was just my <laughs> written videos. That well, now I'm just bummed out that poor Gertie grew up to be murdered by a serial killer. That's that's a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a bummer. Uh, this started a, a, I don't know, five year, decade long obsession with Nev Campbell for me. Um, <laughs> this was Courtney Cox to me before Masters Friends. Of the <laughs> um, I love your deep cut there. Masters of the Universe is my Courtney Cox. Yeah. <laughs> this is, you know, and Eight Legged Freaks are my David Arquette. Yes. Uh, you know, <laughs> so Absolutely. this Get was just, this is such a fucking 90s movie and I'm a 90s guy, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? Um, so I, you know, the soundtrack, we got Nick got Cave Rose in. McGowan in here too. Yeah. yeah. Can't forget Rose McGowan. Matthew Nick, Lillard. Nick Cave in the Bad Skeet Seeds. Ord. Uh, before Peaky Blinders ever did it, Scream did it twice because uh, they dropped that needle twice in this movie. Um, yeah, it's, just, it's a great franchise. It's a great bunch of characters and, and it is clever, you know, and like you said, it's a yeah. little it's a little overdone now, but Scream <clears throat> did it first. And the fact that it's Wes Craven referencing yeah. and often himself. Yeah. Um, there's a great joke in this movie where one of the characters talks about uh uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, and she's like, "Well, the first one, the other one sucked." Yeah, and Wes, <laughs> Wes, Cra Wes Craven just directed the first one. And that's Wes saying, "Mine was well, good, the other one sucked." Was supposedly like Wes Craven wanted that out because I was doing a little research. Oh, really? And he, and he wanted, he didn't want that line in because he's like, it makes me sound like an egotistical yeah, asshole. Yeah, I don't want true. that. But uh, Kevin Williamson was like, no, this is how people actually talk about those movies. Like <sighs> it would make sense for her to say that. And he's like, okay. I agree that it's uncomfy if you're the one that made the first one and yeah. you're the one directing this movie. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Uh, but you know, lots of stuff. And like you said, some of the references are literally just Jamie Kennedy saying titles of movies mm -hmm. or someone else being like, what is this? I spit on your garage, you know? <laughs> Uh, and like revenge horror people like, woo. But at sure. the time, this is the nineties. Yeah. Internet's barely taken off. These conversations about horror films took place in like on basement couches with joints being passed around. Yeah, is, so is and Kevin, so the original was, podcast. It was the first time to see it on screen. Like this and Kevin Smith were the only is, people doing yeah. it. Is Kevin Smith in a screen movie? Yeah. He's in three. He's in three. three okay. Yeah. Cause the whole time when they were talking about, uh, like when Jamie Kennedy and Matthew Lillard are talking about movies in the blockbuster, all he was thinking is like, I wish Kevin Smith was Jamie Kennedy. That would make this movie yeah. so much better for me. Also, because just the mere existence of Jamie Kennedy in your movie automatically deducts half a star. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure Kevin Smith's in the third one. That's why you didn't get a two and a half. Right. <laughs> He's in Die Hard, what, four? Uh, he directed. Oh, no, yeah. Did he direct? No, he didn't. Direct. No, he didn't direct. He directed He's, Cop Out. He, Cop Out. He's yeah. in Live for Your Die Hard, yeah. Okay. And yeah. he worked with Bruce Willis. He's like, hey, we should make a movie. They made a uh, cop out. Hated each like, other. I fucking hate yeah. you, Bruce Willis. <laughs> I, I read there was some story before we go back to Scream, sorry. Uh, that I guess on the set of Cop Out, Bruce Willis would ask Kevin Smith questions like, hey, what lens are you using? What focal length? Like, where? Do, what camera movements are you doing? Because I want to make sure that, like, I hit my marks. And was asking, like, directorial questions in a way. And Kevin Smith's like, I don't fucking know. Yeah. He's like, I don't know what lens I'm using. And I tell the fucking camera guy to set it up and he does it. And like Bruce Willis was just like, I hate you. <laughs> like well, so almost solely because he didn't like the way Kevin Smith did. Anyways. Yeah. Well, it's, it's Kevin Smith. It's Kevin very is, understandable exactly. why those two would not like uh -huh. each other. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, Kevin Smith is like not who you go to for technical questions no. like that. And he's also <laughs> not the one you hire for a studio film like that. You yeah. Know? yeah. Yeah. If you want to give him. 400 grand to like to raise like raise this money make a goofy movie with your family sure and then travel the country showing it and try to make a million 
Yeah. He's your guy. Yeah. He's the dude. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll be there. I'll be seated. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, yeah. Alex. Yeah. I don't know if that made any sense. I was rambling. I did. Uh, what are your thoughts overall on Scream? I love Scream. Scream is not, it's not an annual watch. I was telling you guys before we started that it's like an every other year because we just, my wife and I don't like getting burnt out on it or anything because it's just a very special like horror movie for us. For me, Scream as a franchise was my gateway mm -hmm. into horror movies. And I was thinking about this this morning was like, how much scream kind of satiates that sort of like hyper fixation part of my brain because what it is like oh i'm gonna watch this horror movie oh it's referencing a ton of other horror movies i'm like writing down the name drops so i can be like okay okay this will help me better understand because yeah, i've never seen prom night uh, i haven't seen prom night either but there was a prom night remake that yeah. i do remember yeah uh, 2008 i think something like that but the, the thing i love about scream is Wes Craven kind of already attempted it in 94 with uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, New Nightmare. So the seventh one. Seventh. Uh, so he started trying to contextualize the meta horror movie two years before he even started doing Scream and got Kevin Williamson to kind of think round out the idea because New Nightmare is a little clunky in its execution. But having something like that, that is this dissection of a genre who... For me, when I was, I think I got into it around the time like Scream 2, Scream 3 came out was when I first started getting into the franchise to take someone like me who was scared and was frightened and who hates anxiety and tension based horror mm -hmm. to get a movie that's like, here is this genre you don't like. Let's take all of the tropes about it. Let's go through everything that makes these what they are, like the, the actual filmic DNA of it. Let's dissect it. Let's talk about how dumb they are and let's build a movie on top of it. Yeah. Like the fact that you've got characters in a horror movie who are aware they're in a horror movie is so smart because now they're starting to like, OK, what are the rules? What are the examples? And I really for me and I hope for other people, like at least my same age or whatever, watched it and it helped them kind of like understand this genre that maybe they would have stepped away from for so long or treaded yeah. away from because it's like, I don't like being frightened. But like to see something to be like, no, horror is dumb and stupid. And here's why. Like we're just in it for the blood or in it for, you know, unless it's like a Halloween situation. But I think Scream is just so yeah, Scream smart. calls out the misogyny. Yeah. Calls out the stupidity. Um, and I think ironically caused a resurgence in slasher films. Because slasher was dead when well, Scream and, came out. And then you look at mid late 90s too and you're getting that whole like senator lieberman push for like violence in video games the violence in media and that was when that a lot mm. of that groundswell post reagan stuff was really yeah. pushing up and too. they called attention to, to call attention movies to. don't make yeah yeah and to be like no this is just this one specific genre let's call attention to it and and, and in a language that i feel like i was like how do i talk to steve about this uh joe so, lieberman well i was gonna say <laughs> as you say lieberman i'm like oh f I got right. like, like fuck joe lieberman i've been playing mortal Kombat, <laughs> but like it's it was that thing where when i looked at it uh i was trying to find like a good analog like modern analog and for me it was a lot of like uh what lower decks did for me for star trek mm -hmm. where yeah. it is taking this thing that's like yes this is show is dumb and it's stupid and it's boring and it's cheesy and it's corny but here's why we can love it for that and here's why how and why we can embrace these tropes and these things that we're sitting there like oh horror movies what oh don't fucking go in there and they're like yeah no don't go in there yeah don't have sex don't do that you know whatever and to take these things to be like yes this genre is stupid and it's sexploitative and it's violent and it's gory and it's over the top here's why we love it for that i thought it was just like looking back on it now 25 years later ish and be like wow like this was such a well executed like dissection and vivisection of a genre that they then were like now let's build a successful movie on top of it and in an age of pre-cell phone ubiquity and in the sense of the first screen pre-caller id ubiquity yeah you know like i love if a horror movie succeeds it's either because of the mascot or because they made you afraid of something you didn't know you should be afraid of in your own home and you take something like the strangers where it succeeds in being like oh there's someone in my whatever yeah but like yeah <laughs> The <laughs> scream in the way in like the mid 90s, early 2000s, just kind of like the phone rings and you don't have caller ID. You're just like, oh, shit, you know, kind of just makes you scared to answer the phone, which is something we do every day. Oh, man. Day back then. When that phone rang and Drew Barrymore instantly answered it, I'm like, not believable for right. me. <laughs> it's like people, knock on, like people will knock on the door I and you'll see the movie phone. like oh come in and I'm like oh no we're jumping on the ground like we're like hide and stay away from the windows whatever but like yeah I, I love the fact that it can it makes it made people afraid to do a simple thing that they like an everyday task and then also dissected a, a beloved genre 
and actually tried to put this mainstream appeal to it, be like, no, here's why we love it for all the reasons that people are shitting on it. And then, yeah, and then to make an actual like successful horror within the boundaries that they establish and the parameters, because I don't think that's something that's really been looked at either. And like, I think what it did for the slasher genre is, yeah, revitalize it and bring it into like a new age. Absolutely. Like, like you've pointed on, it's been built off of so much. And it's one of those movies, and we talk about a, a few of them on here, but if, like, if you're going to, if you're going to see like a, a three minute super cut of just, if you want to show someone cinema or you want to make like a, a stereotypical celebration of, of, of movies, mm -hmm. it's going to have all these clips and you're going to see like uh, the shark from Jaws jumping yeah. out of the water. You're going to see Marlon Brando petting a fucking cat. Uh, you're going to see, uh, uh, you know, Norman Leather Bates face spinning around with a chainsaw. Yeah, Norman Bates stabbing through a shower curtain, yeah. you know, and, but, and then at some point you're going to see Drew Barrymore holding a phone, mm -hmm. you know, like this is one of those movies. It's just, yeah. it's that fucking good. It's that yeah. fucking uh, it's, it, iconic. It, it, it unsettles you so much. It's just like a small thing. You know, you just, yeah, I love big fan. Mm -hmm. So that's our intro. Uh, I think we got a good distillation of opinions on this movie. We'll, we'll, we'll go into a scene by scene recap as quick as we can. I took probably way too many notes. Uh, we, we've already <laughs> talked about it's directed by Wes Craven, of course. <clears throat> Excuse me. Written by Kevin Williamson with an all-star 90s cast. We've got Nev Campbell, Courtney Cox, uh, David Arquette. Skeet Ulrich. Skeet Ulrich might be worth a mention. <laughs> uh, Drew Barrymore, of course, briefly in the beginning there. Rose McGowan, um, Jamie Kennedy, Matthew Lillard. The Drew Barrymore misdirect at the beginning is so good too because yes, she's featured so heavily about in the marketing. Uh, like if you like, not I, just that, but she's already the most famous one in yeah. the movie at this time. And she is like, I remember buying. So you do not expect her to die. I remember buying Scream on DVD and even noticing after having seen it, like, wow, they really featured her heavily. Like even on like the DVD distribution, like years mm -hmm. later, you know, like she's so prominently featured on the poster. She's like one of the top billed actresses mm -hmm. in the very first scene, and like, yeah, just to subvert everybody like that, you know. When you Especially. see her hanging from the tree in 1996, yes. you were like, what the fuck? It was, it's yeah. such a, it's such a, oh no, the gloves are off. Okay. Like this is something, even if it's maybe the same genre wise, this is something different. Yeah. It's like, you've already kind of like fucked with everybody at the jump. You know? Yeah, absolutely. That's like making a movie today and you've got like Brad Pitt and then it also stars Glenn Powell and, and, uh, Jack Quaid. And then Brad Pitt Why dies in the first five say, minutes. I knew you were going to say Jack Quaid. <laughs> I knew you were going to say I was Jack trying Quaid. to think like, who's like kind of famous, but also everybody's like, man, eh. yeah. Uh, and that's what I, I came up Jack with. Quaid. Um, cause I, I think Courtney Cox was a pretty big deal at this time mm -hmm. due to friends. Sure. Um, but yeah, anyway, this is one of those, this is on the Mount Rush for, for me. This is like the craft. Yeah. This man, probably the faculty, Okay. Uh, I would put Starship Troopers on my personal. Sure. Yeah. Fucking love oh, Starship man. Troopers. When we review in that one. I hope soon. Come on. I hope soon. The only good bug is a dead bug. <laughs> man. If I could be from anywhere, I'd be from Buenos Aires. This movie, I, I, I believe Scream was originally titled Scary Movie, uh, which makes, makes the parody film series funny. Yeah. Um, and they changed it to Scream, which I, I like. Scream? Because it was a scary movie is maybe too on the nose for... Um, the meta commentary of horror films. And so Scream might be a better title for that reason. Especially like, I think if you made a, I think if you made a movie like this today and mm -hmm. named it Scary Movie, great. But 1996, I think that would have been too like, what this is this? Plane that sounds stupid. Yet. Why would yeah. I see the movie called Scary Movie? Was well, it going to be scary? Oh yeah. It would be because, you know, it's the 90s. We're all dumb back then. So it'd be like, who is this mean? You know, I don't think <laughs> yeah. it would have done well. Yeah. They laughed and jerked off a lot in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> Ribbons of jizz. <laughs> The movie opens iconically with Drew Barrymore's character. The phone rings. There's, I think I added them up. There's five different calls that she answers. And I would be out after the first one for sure. I'm with and, you guys. And then after, when she takes the second call, Dutch angles. That's right, baby. Just so you know, things are a little oh, score. Yeah. Things are a little askew. Yeah. Score kicks up. Yeah. Uh, I, I like that she, I'm about to watch a video because this is like the height of Blockbuster, yeah. right? Yeah. So it wasn't like a movie to her. Like she specified that a it was a tape. videotape, yeah. baby. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. That was a dumb thing to pull out, but it's funny to me. That old popcorn that you put on the stove. Yes. I never did that. I never did that either. That's a I, little bit before my time. I was microwaver from from birth. Same, same. Uh, <laughs> but I wonder if it tastes good, like better. Well, yeah, I wonder if it's supposed to be better. Yeah, hmm. I don't know. Uh, and then this is when she makes the joke about uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. The first one was the rest sucked. Um, and then there's a couple more calls. 
Her boyfriend's name is Steve. I don't know how you felt about that, Steve. That made you uncomfy. Steve out there getting gutted. That's my name. Steve. I hope nothing happens to him. Steve. I was immediately like, oh, man, he's going to die first. Because <laughs> I would die first in a horror film for sure. Is that why you gave it two stars? Yeah. yeah. Immediately. He's like, yeah. fuck this movie. Fuck this movie. This has besmirched all Steven's past, present, and future. <laughs> they killed the avatar of me. Steve May 1 through 12. We must... Assemble that, yeah. That was Steve May 3. They killed Steve May 3, unfortunately. <laughs> um, Steve's oh, by, by tied way, up the, on the patio. So, the voice of the like, the, the, do you like scary movies? Yeah, that yeah. dude. Uh, so that's a guy named Roger Jackson. And when he's when it started talking, I immediately was like, I fucking know who that is. And it took me so long to place it. This is just the dude who's the voice of every ancillary NPC character in every video game I played in the mid to late aughts. So like if there were like cops in GTA, like you get on the ground, it's that yeah. guy. Do It's like the same voice. And so the whole time, like, and then he's also, uh, what's your favorite felony to commit? <laughs> I think he's like uh corporal Presley or something from mass effect. So that's also huh, where okay, I know yeah. from, but like his voice started going off. Like I know, I know this voice so hard. It was driving me nuts. The first thing oh, I literally had to pause the movie before he killed Drew Barrymore. Like, who is this? <laughs> I need to know it's bugging me. I don't need to know who's under the mask. Just who's on the other end of the phone. Yeah. No. And then I saw his phone. I'm like, well, he didn't actually kill people on screen. Mm -mm. <laughs> it's a great, it's a great voice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you know, iconic and I kind of wish it was that dude. Like if you look at Roger Jackson's photo, could you imagine that dude just, <laughs> hey. just trolling around? Like, I'm going to get you. It's me. Slow down. Uh, <laughs> get off my lawn. Steve's tied up on the patio and she has to play movie trivia uh, to save his life. We know by the end, he admits I was going to kill you no matter what. Right. Mm -hmm. If you lose, you die. If you win, you die. Which is not fair. That's no, not a fair way to play a game. Not, I, don't, I don't like those prizes. That is a carny game. And she misses the question because, of course, Jason Voorhees is not the killer in the first movie. It's I knew that one. Mrs. Voorhees. Even I knew that one. I think in the 90s, that was a harder rest, question. Would you have known it? Yeah. No, that's one of the... I think your mind does jump to Jason when you think of Friday the 13th. And uh, under duress, it's possible. Yeah, sure, sure. I do think it's funny how a lot of these people are huge fans of horror movies, but they like lack necessary knowledge sometimes. Like, is that the guy with the nicer fingers? Yeah, Freddy Krueger. Right. Like, there's a lot of that happening where I don't hate it because we all know people like that. Oh, man, I love horror movies. Yeah. Uh, what's that dude's name? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that type of shit's it's, real to It's me. giving name three songs because somebody's wearing the band t-shirt, though. Yeah. You know, it's <laughs> giving. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of gatekeepy. Yeah. But, you know, I think they're they're it, it plays to a bigger audience. Yeah. To, to say the guy with the nicer fingers. It's, then it's, you're right. No, but, but I think that's separating real. people who watch movies for art and people who watch them for entertainment, <laughs> Steve. <laughs> because, again, this is pre Reddit. You know, this is pre YouTube. Yeah. No, I'm saying that's a good thing. Yeah, I like yeah. that it does it. <laughs> Can you imagine like, like, oh, yeah, we'll slide. <laughs> Fucking stab this ratio. <laughs> like, oh no, I hate Gen Z scream. Well, they do. That, that, that's scream six. I know. Uh, <laughs> no cap. <laughs> if you don't answer these questions, you're about to catch a fade. You're about to be dead ass. Uh, What's your riz? Like, what? Ooh, that's a good question. You're giving main character energy right now, Nancy. He just texts them in the newest ones. Hello. Hello. <laughs> He's like, What's your it's, car's it's warranty? It's a Snapchat of the knife. Like, ah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but there's like the dog filters on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the killer, Steve dies. He gets like disemboweled completely. Aww. And uh, what happened to him? She ends up. I think he just ran a knife across the stomach and the intestines fell out. Ghost That's my guess. Very, Ghostface is very nimble. He is. He's like, well, there's yeah. two of them. Well, yeah. So, well, like even the whole because she isn't she like looking out the patio window with the, the lights off and you're like, so she turns the. The lights on and then there's like no one there so it's like he had to like do like a drive-by knifing basically. Yeah, well, the only time i was like how did he pull that off because it's uh, ostensibly it's probably billy loomis is with the principal henry winkler when the fonz is getting killed yeah and he keeps knocking on the door yeah the second he knock, opens he ran out there so quick and the hallway was empty and i'm like where'd he go because like i like to imagine this is a funny exercise i do yeah. in my head yeah. i'm picturing him going <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gotta make sense of it. That'd be so funny if, like, Henry Winkler, like, looks both ways, closes the door, and the camera pans up, and he's doing <laughs> he's that thing Mission he's, he's Mission Impossible on the ceiling. <laughs> and it's, it's also ridiculous <laughs> that throughout this movie, it's like, it's broad daylight summertime in this small town of Woodsboro, and this dude's outfit is literally like these giant death robes. And no one sees and him. And no one's around. seeing him like sneaking through the woods and stuff. Like, yeah. with the, hey, it's so sunny. He's actually moving between the shadows. 
Yeah. People are just like, oh, wow, like that shadow's got some depth. Or like in the garage scene with Rose McGowan, I thought to myself this time, that's why I gave it four and a half. I was mm-hmm. like, he's going to reek of beer because she broke like three beer bottles on his chest. Oh, yeah. And he's going to take that thing off and go right back to the party because yeah. I'm assuming it's actually Stu Mocker. Uh, sure. But it's dumb. It's And none of that actually matters. Like any of right. those real critiques of this movie, the movie is aware of and yeah. is doing on purpose. And so it's like any criticism you're going to levy at this film, it already levied it itself. And so it's almost not going to stick. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Cause Wes Craven's like, this is dumb. All these movies do this and that's what we're making fun of. Right. Anyway, we'll get there. Steve's fucking dead. Not our Steve, dumb Hi. Steve, football Steve. Still here. Uh, I woke up again today. <laughs> yep. Life it just keeps happening. <laughs> I woke up today and thought, ah, uh, another one. <laughs> <laughs> she sneaks outside and like Alex pointed out as a viewer, the first time in 1996, you're thinking, okay, star star is sure. about to get away. She sees you a know. car coming down the street the movies about to begin. And then she gets fucking stabbed. It's heartbreaking because she got choked. She can't call out to her parents who are a little extra uh, not paying attention. I'll grant you. They just got back from a very They just got back from a very boozy book club. Yeah. All right? yeah. yeah. I would like to have he- heard more funny dialogue. You know, yeah, the, like, that's like oh, I'm coming on. in the back door tonight, honey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I needed that party like I needed six stabs in the back and strung up on a tree. Oh, my daughter. Oh, no. I hope they weren't recording me. Also, she's still holding the cordless phone. And so her mother can like hear her dying and getting yeah. stabbed, which is terrifying. Mm-hmm. Uh, somehow he manages to like string her up in a tree before running off. Like very quickly he gets her in that tree. If you think about it, <laughs> if you think about it. Yeah, you know. Um, he, he, before the hijacks, they, they, it's probably the order of operations, right? Yeah. You kidnap Steve, you tie him up, you set up a pulley system on a tree so you sure. can string Drew Barrymore up. And that way you just get everything say You get all the physical stuff set up. So that way all you got to do is just execute. Well, yeah, one of the, the ghost so like faces. Snap trap, so she's like, just like Stu's out there ready with the fulcrum. Right. You know, like, hurry up, man. The parents right. are here. Exactly. It's awkward. Yeah. <laughs> I just waved at we him when he drove by. Oh, is that Stu? <laughs> what a nice young man. <laughs> Nobody likes, none of the parents like Why Stu. Why has he got a noose? Yeah. Can you imagine oh, if well. like Stu or Billy had like a very distinctive running style? Like just the actor, like Skeet Ulrich or Matthew Lillard just couldn't stop like walking or running a certain funny way. And so every time like you just see like Ghostface run by, it's like, oh, that's that's got to be Matthew Lillard. Like the Riker Ling. He We're prances. Just, you know, it's like, oh, hey, wait, he runs like Matthew Lillard. I've watched Scooby do a lot. He's a, he, he prances. Um, and that's the opening of the movie. Jinkies. We cut to our main character, Nev Campbell, playing Sydney. Um, Billy shows up, climbs through a window and the whole creep. He's a super horny, insensitive, terrible gaslighting person. Creep. 90s. The dad comes in to investigate. Uh, I do like the like Chekhov's closet door where he can't get into her room because the closet's open and propping it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because that comes into play later. That's how she like blocks uh, Ghostface from getting in the room. Uh, and then his like way to turn her on, right? Like he's trying to get her horny. I was watching The Exorcist. It made me think of you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what? Uh Remember how when we first started dating, we were a solid R rating, heading straight towards NC-17, baby. NC-17. Have you ever seen that, buddy? <laughs> what were you wanting? Uh, yeah. Now, now we're editing for television. television. <laughs> <laughs> and we find out later, why is she less horny? Oh, because her mom was sexually assaulted and murdered. Yeah. And I mean, that would do it. And, and everyone's like, been slut shaming her mom this whole fucking yeah. movie, too. And late, he's like, it's been a year. You need to get over it. <laughs> I know it's what like it's creep. been a year is not that long. Yeah. Yeah. This first scene, I just immediately was like, this guy, he's either the killer or he needs to be killed. Right. The <laughs> only way he wasn't such an obvious piece of shit is when society needed serious changes and he didn't come off that way, you know, which I can't, again, I was eight. Sure. Hopefully he came off as an immediate creep, but I, I kind of doubt it. I, the first time I watched it, like when I was a kid, I was like, ah, oh, I feel like he's telegraphed. You know, I, yeah. th- I think the twist is the two killers, not so much just like well, who. Like, I think they telegraph the first well, one. I agree. And then spend the second act trying to throw you off the scent. When Billy gets stabbed, yeah, it's like, oh shit, right. major red herring until the whole coin syrup. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he wants to do some. On- like they didn't carry ta ta ta. <laughs> he wants to do. Some, I am very smart. <laughs> some on top of the clothes stuff, uh, and this immediately is- goes under. 
Yes. Dude, bro didn't even wait a second. No. He's like, I can't help it. I can't help it. I've been watching Exorcist all day. I'm riled right. up. You know what the Exorcist does to me. <laughs> she starts spitting that green pea soup. It'd and I'm just so, like, Ugh. like, It'd be great if like he referenced another Wes Craven movie instead of the Exorcist. If he's like, oh, I've been watching Swamp Thing and thinking about you. And you're just like, oh. Or a Creature from the Black Lagoon. You can understand why I that would, would turn someone that. on. Yeah. Uh, have you seen Gill Man? Man. <laughs> baby, them, I want you to play Gill Man. Them lips do it for me. Gill's up, baby. Gil, Gill's up in the chat. Gill's up. <laughs> this is when she flashes him and says, what about a PG-13 relationship? Uh, which I don't think you're, I don't think they show boobs in too many PG-13s. I don't know. I don't you get that see, reference. You can see boobies in PG-13. Yeah. 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 Rarely. Rarely. Yeah. Like it, one pair. It's, it's like a, <laughs> <laughs> not yeah. even one, one. Just, boob. <laughs> just one. You yeah. can either get the left one or the center one. <laughs> but the I center can't. one. Thre- <laughs> Is this the woman from the, uh, Total Recall? It's whatever you want yes. it to be, Steve. Oh, okay. Throughout this movie, I could not stop thinking of the Wayans Brothers scary movie. Yeah. Which I've seen way more times sure. than this. Yeah. Uh, because in that iteration, when she flashes, it cuts to the boobs and it's just like a hairy man chest yeah. and he falls out of the window. <laughs> and so I immediately thought of that and started laughing at this part of the movie. And this happened several times to me. Um, anyway, we cut to the news and cops are at the school, which seems like an inappropriate way to go about this interrogation, like interrupting the kids at school. But hey, maybe the late 90s had no emotional sensitivity. That's true. We've got to just move on. Fuck you. Your mom died. It's been a year. <laughs> what more do you want? Yeah. Shut up and eat your corn. All right, like, guys. You know, a couple of your friends died last night. Brutally. We think it's one of you. Pop All right. Quiz, motherfuckers. <laughs> Talk to the cops. And then the news is outside waiting to capitalize off your grief. Uh, so Courtney Cox plays Gail Weathers, which is a purposely bad reporter name. They yeah. even call attention to it. Uh, Rose, Ga- Rose McGowan plays Tatum, I, her friend, which what, is also Dewey's bro- uh, sister. Mm-hmm. I, I wrote a f- uh, Fantastic Four parody movie. Fanfic? It was it was the it was the spiritual sequel to Spider Mike if you remember yeah that one was Rose McGowan in it or something no no but uh, <laughs> one, one, a big part of that screenplay dealt with all the news anchors in town being abducted and one of them was named Carl Weathers nice nice <laughs> nice Star Wars maybe you got a stew going <laughs> you got a stew going um, yeah and then they they allude Fan fiction for. <laughs> Tatum alludes to her Sydney's name mother. is Tatum. Rose McGowan's name is Tatum. It's Tatum, right? I don't yeah. get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not a name. I was going cr- like the whole time, like, what are they saying to her? Like they kept saying her name. Like, hey, Tatum, come here. I'm like, that can't be her name. Is that short for something? What is her name? Yeah, Someone ch- please tell me her name. Channing's name. That's a last name. Her Tatum first O'Neil. name is Tatum. Tatum Ooh, O'Neill from Paper Moon. Uh, oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actual just, actress. Actual famous person's name is Tatum. It's not a real name. <laughs> don't get Alex started on Paper Moon. We don't uh, have time. Uh, uh, it's, <laughs> it's Sydney's turn to be interrogated. She goes in to be interrogated by the cops and the Fonz. Uh, who's actually there to protect her? The Fonz is looking out for it, right? Yeah. He, he hits the jukebox. I love the Fonz in this movie. Yeah, it's good to see Henry Winkler yeah. like right. pre Barry, but post Happy Days. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. And if he was my principal, I'd respect that authority. I can't remember what was his name in Arrested Development. Do you guys remember? I never watched the lawyer. It's not Barry it's, Zuckercord. Yeah, Barry there Zuckercord. Yeah, I remember Barry uh, Bob blah blah. But because I was trying to think, like, is he a better principal than he is a lawyer? <laughs> I think <laughs> functionally, he's probably a better principal. Probably. <laughs> he always just plays such a caring individual. I love that about yeah, him. And I, yeah, and so it was good to see him as like a, you know. Knows the grindstone. Yeah. Stern principal no nonsense. for once. Yeah. yeah. He was a really good guy. Yeah. A little, a Cared little about too. the students. Yeah. He went a little too far. But again, this is 90s little, school. Yeah. He, was, he was a little touchy with the students. A little bit. I did right. Yeah. The way that he like caressed her chin. I'm sure. like, yeah. can't do that. No. That's weird. <laughs> right. But then when he was yelling at the pranksters later on, I'm like, yes, yeah, do it. Him. But also Expel cool. But, them. But, right. but also he threatened them with scissors. You know. Good. That expulsion's not going <laughs> to stick. He's a little emotionally unhinged, and yeah. I think that's a perfect temperament for Henry Winkler. Of course, the, which, which the fact that he's later cosplaying as Ghostface kind of takes a lot of the stank right. of, of him expelling you know, them away. Yeah, he's yeah. like, all right, now that I'm alone, this is pretty cool. Right. It feels uh, pretty good. See, oh, I'm touching myself tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, touching my chin. We meet Matthew Lillard as Stu Mocker and Jamie Kennedy as Randy uh, in what became becomes the iconic 
main cast of kid characters discussing the murder mm-hmm. outside the school scene. It's parodied in, parodied in several other Scream movies itself after this, but they sit outside kind of eating their lunch, talking about the murders. Matthew Lillard insensitively, right? Live her alone. Live her alone. He's really uh, happy about that pun. Solid pun. Uh, and then we get a Luton bus transition. Um, are you guys familiar with the Luton bus? I'm not familiar with the Luton bus. So the movie uh, Cat People is the first time it's done, but it's like the first jump scare. Okay. Uh, Val Luton, I think, was the producer of that movie, but it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. In that movie, it's like this person, this woman is being stalked by who you think is the cat monster at that point in the yeah. movie. And right up until the, the music crescendos and you hear what sounds like the hiss of a monster, but is actually the hydraulic brakes of the bus. So it's like, mm. and it. it's just the bus pulling Got up. It. It's the original jump scare. Okay. It's very effective. Yeah. And now every horror movie known to man parodies that version of jump scare. It's called the Luton bus. Okay. But in this movie, it's literally just like, there's no ramping up of tension. It's just like a loud noise. That is a bus S- meant to jolt you. You know, yeah. I just thought it was just to kind of break it down. as like why it's not effective is there. I was intense and mm-hmm. you just made the shit loud. And that, that annoys me. <laughs> um, Make this shit loud. I saw pet cemetery bloodlines at fantastic fest. Yeah. It's, it's not out yet. I don't think it's fucking terrible. Sure. Uh, there's only the, one good pet cemetery. Every scare in that movie is just, loud noises you don't uh, expect and yeah. it's like stop you're you're annoying not scary you know? Do you know what do you know what happens when everything in the cemetery is actually lined up and even what you get pet symmetry oh by the way i tweeted it earlier but it's like stephen king is such a good writer yeah you would think he would know how to spell cemetery yeah i was actually i was replying to your tweet with that joke i just saved it for here because you walked out the door <laughs> thanks in the twitter synergy <laughs> This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. It can be tough out there as we try to navigate the many twists and turns that life throws our way. Not every problem we face has an obvious or easy solution, but talking through these issues can always bring major benefits. So whether you're dealing with a career change, relationship help, or just getting used to your new normal, therapy helps you stay connected to what you really want while you navigate life so you can move forward with confidence and excitement. I myself have benefited from therapy. I have benefited from BetterHelp. I was struggling to find myself and figure out who I was post-divorce. BetterHelp matched me with an amazing therapist who taught me all about codependency, what it was, and ways I can combat it and realize my whole true self. So if it sounds like therapy is the right move for you, then give BetterHelp a try. It's online, convenient, flexible, and can work with your schedule. Filling out a brief questionnaire is all it takes to get matched with a licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists at any time. To start your own therapy journey, visit betterhelp.com slash streaming things today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash streaming things. It's the month of September, and with a new month comes a new opportunity for us to be thankful for all of the stream fiends who help us at Streaming Things keep the lights on and make this show what it is. So let's give a super patron shout out to some of our most ardent supporters on patreon.com slash streaming things. Thank you so much to Becky the Farmer, Kaylee Sampson, Stanton Valentino, Sunshine, Huckleberry Cauliflower, Optimus, Mike from New Hampshire, Brett X, Emily Scarano. Lil Tickler, Svento7, Jay Scramo, AK Ashley Ray, Adam Busby, Wendy O'Loughlin, Jason Hawkins, Butthorn, Conrad, David Malfara, Rabbit Dog in a Barbie Car, Jose Ruben Cruz Rodriguez, Charlie Friday, Alexis Adler, Emmy, Joe Velez, Valerie, John Collins, Amber McVeigh, Amanda King, Trisha Bueller, Sun Loving Mortal, Suzanne Road, Jadinglage Morgoon, Jen Robinson, Kate, Kalisha Reeves, Aaron Armstrong, Kevin Strother, Jeanette Murphy, Ashley Powers, Stephen V, Casey McCain, and Enza. And with that, back to the show. Anyway, uh, yeah, they are all very insensitive. Sydney storms off. Um, she goes home. She asked, uh, she calls Tatum. She's like, hey, can I sleep at your house? Because she's scared, right? Because her mm-hmm. dad's out of town. Uh, very deja vu. Another allusion to her, her mother being murdered. Like all the cops and reporters. It just makes me feel icky, right? And Tatum's like, okay, I'll come pick you up at 7 o'clock. Um, there's, she's trying to watch TV. There's nothing but murder on the news. And then we hear the backstory about her mother. Maureen Prescott was raped and murdered a year ago is what the news anchor says. And she's like, oh, not watching that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then she falls asleep until 715. 
You guys remember those post school naps mm. where yeah. you get home at like four and yeah. sleep to about seven? Yeah, mm-hmm. those were fire, weren't they? Yeah, they were. I I, I miss those so much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can't. It's as an adult, you could easily come home at five and sleep after work, I guess. But like, I never it's do. Just going to bed. Yeah, exactly. Like that yeah, at that point, you're yeah. just in bed. Yeah. If I fall asleep when I get home from work, yeah, I'm not yeah. getting up to the morning <laughs> or ever. Yeah. Like I have to be. <laughs> if only I were so lucky. <laughs> I would have to be exceedingly hungry. Yeah. To like get out of bed at that moment. Like, well, it would fuck you up too. Yeah. Like when I do that, I'm going to be up from <sighs> like two to five in a weird yeah. way, which yeah. I kind of love though. Mm-hmm. That's my favorite thing in the world. I never Ugh. do it anymore. It's gross. No, yeah. because like everyone you love yeah. is safe and near you, sure. but also not bothering you because yeah. they're asleep. <laughs> it's but the like, perfect combination of alone, alone and with company. You mm. kick one motion activated toy and it's <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's awake. You no, know? no, no, no. Yeah. You just got to, you know, use your headphones or something. Uh, but anyway, yeah, she's uh, waiting for Tatum. She wakes up at 7.15. Tatum's late. She's late. Uh, so Tatum calls her. Don't worry. Casey and Steve didn't bite it until after 10. So <laughs> like nobody dies till after 10 based yeah. on the one time somebody's died recently. Uh, and then the killer calls next. And 9.55, that early bird. <laughs> it's, it's an echo of the scene with Drew Barrymore. I'm but getting the worm tonight. Only, <laughs> only this time... N- uh, Cindy, Cindy doesn't like scary movies, unlike uh, Casey. Yeah, she, she, just, was, she was watching watch all the right movies where you can see Tom Cruise's penis. That's right. Well, she's down to. That was Tatum's suggestion. If you pause it at the right time, you can see his penis. Yeah, Cindy was like, okay. okay. Uh, I'm not I'm not, not going to watch that. Going to put her life in cruise control for a minute. <laughs> yeah, that's help. right. Yeah. Uh, and so. Zinu, I, help me. I, I do like the comment where she's like, why don't you like scary movies? And she's like, it's just, it's, it's insulting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Everybody, they, she, some chick with big tits runs upstairs instead of out the front door like she obviously should. And then right after this, we get a situation where because the front door has the chain on it, yeah. she tries, but then is forced to run upstairs. And so it was like, I don't know, Wes Craven being really cheeky. Like, mm. I've made fun of this, but then given a very good reason of why she's yeah. running upstairs. Like, like you said, like they call attention to it and they do it and mm-hmm. everybody's having a good time. I think it's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, the whole I'm on the front porch thing, I guess, is the idea here that he tricked her into being brazen and snuck inside while she was on the porch? Yeah, because so I, I or was he to, always in the house? No, I meant to point this. Well, he might have been in the house. I, I took it that like he tricked her and snuck calls in kind of thing, too, because mm-hmm. earlier in the movie, when she first came home, there's this really weird music cue when she's walking through a house. She opens the closet and the music goes. <gasps> Like it's this weird. Well, the like, music's sinister the whole time she's walking through the house. Yeah, but, but there's this like weird crescendo, like something creepy in the closet. But yeah. the, but the action is there's no tension at all in the scenes. And I mm-hmm. remember writing that they're like that was fucking a weird. I know what cute. you're talking but about. He's, but then later on, when we get to this scene, he's hiding in the closet. So it's almost like this almost preemptive, like oh something in the closet. Ah, yeah. there's no one in it. But then later on, <laughs> he was. Yeah, he's I just think biding his he's time. trying to like lull yeah. you into not seeing the closet is scary because you know, right. hinted at it before and everything. Exactly. Do you think he was in the closet the whole time? No. And then when she no. fell asleep, he's like, fuck. Well, She's I, never going to answer the it's phone. Sunny in Philadelphia he's actually episode. called her like nine times. Oh my <laughs> oh God. God. When will this bitch wake up? How <laughs> many Zannies did she take? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Damn it. But I think they make a point of her walking Please away. Please enjoy the music while your party is reached. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they make a point of her walking away from the door and looking around the corner and not mm-hmm. looking back at the door and leaving it wide open. I think yeah. that's the supposed to be the thing where he's, <laughs> you know, he did the ghost face yeah. like, let me uh, get you. He yeah. ran in there real quick. To, Some creaky boards would undo his whole plan. Oh, oh she just turns so around much. and he's standing there like, to Hi. throw in a deep cut real quick, because <laughs> so uh, just you guys talking about the, this stuff in particular, about like the movements within the house, the phone call stuff and everything. There is a pre-Halloween John Carpenter movie that was made. It was a made for TV movie called Somebody's Watching Me or Someone's Watching Me. But uh it has a lot of those things where like you're seeing John Carpenter really practice for Halloween and there's yeah. stuff like that where it's like people are in the house and like you don't know. And like there's a spot where the main actress uh, whose name escapes me is on the phone and she's kind of like looking out. So she's facing the camera. And while she's on the phone, you see somebody from behind like her chair dart out and the music just does this quick like bam like a quick orchestral hit and you just see the shadow run off behind and like out the door. And it's the, literally the only scary bit in the scary movie that is someone's watching me, <laughs> but like you can see so much of that get pulled from scream. And that's, that's another thing that I love about it is while it is, you know, it's has those same moments where it's trying to like misdirect you and misguide you while it's also still trying to deliver the thrills. And just a weird moment reminded me of a movie I will never watch again. No, I get that. And I think they're, 
you talking about that makes me think though, there are a lot of moments that are like, um, visual references. Mm -hmm. Like there's the, they say the titles of movies. Yeah. There's a few, uh, overt homage references to other movies, but there's also like some visual things to horror in general. Like when she opens the, I think it's a refrigerator in this scene before she gets talking to the killer on the, before she takes a nap, she opens the refrigerator and it's like the shot is set up where like it's a profile shot of Sydney when she opens um, there's a lot of negative space in the hallway behind her. When she opens the fridge, all that negative space is hidden by the fridge door. Yeah. It's an iconic horror move to like open a cabinet, close cabinet. Now there's a thing that wasn't there before. Right. Right. And so you expect there to, there to be something because of the music, but then she closes it and there's still nothing there. Yeah. And he's just like teasing you. He's playing yeah. with your balls a little bit. Yeah. He's like, don't and, worry. And that's the, I think Nor that's, <laughs> it drives that tension, that underlying, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, but she doesn't like scary movies. She doesn't believe that it's any, she thinks it's fucking Randy for a while. Um, I'm not Randy. what if I'm not Randy? And that, I love how there's like the, it's like, you're not Randy. <laughs> he already I said he's not Randy. This. Uh, <laughs> but she goes on the porch. He sneaks in or is already in there. She comes back in. He's in the fucking house. He slams her head on the ground and shit. It's really violent. I'm like, ah, stop being mean to Sydney. Uh, she ends up having to run upstairs after she said that that was dumb. Uh, and then we have the closet door brought back. That's how. Ghostface can't get in there. He's mm -hmm. like my miming of him trying to reach his knife in. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, she can't call the police, so she like calls them on her computer. Yeah. Which I'm mm -hmm. not a computer. I'm not a, a dial-up like internet a, whiz, but like a hip relay kind of thing. I don't know how she did that, but I'm I'm down with it. I thought um, that was gonna come back. Me too. Yeah. There's actually there's text 911 now. Another reason I give this a 4.5. There are multiple times where they call the police in this movie and nothing happens. Like uh in the climax, Sydney calls them, actually reaches a police officer and then gets inter interrupted. Or it might be uh, Gail uh, that calls on a cell phone mm -hmm. and then reaches them and then ends up hitting Jamie Kennedy with it. And then Sydney CBs them and they're like, what's up? Uh, and then none of the cops ever show up mm -hmm. until later when they call them a third time. Have you guys ever dialed the cops as a prank as a kid? No, uh, no but uh, there's a there's, there's a story where my niece did that. I did it, yeah. Well, she, she was like four she was very little. Yeah, I was probably like six. And and my brother tells a story where they're, they're just hanging out at home and the police show up and they're like, is everything right? All right. And he's like, yeah, what's going on? It's like, we got a call from here. And did you guys call? And he goes, no. And they look at Olivia, who's like four and at the time. And they're like, Olivia, did you call the cops? She's like, yeah. <laughs> she's just sitting on the couch. She's like, yeah. And they're like, why would you do that? She's like, I wanted to see what would happen. Yeah. But I, I <laughs> that's think fair. that's still like the ineffectual police department, uh, I think really still fits in with a lot of the same horror tropes and horror genre that, you know, the movie goes yes. through. Is because like even that, the that, sheriff in this movie is a goober. Yeah. And, and Dewey's whole, a super goober. That whole part of that is such a core theme of Nightmare on Elm Street, which is, you know, the other Wes Craven vehicle is this whole, like the parents don't believe their kids. The parents usually have some sort of like abusive or like problematic vice of some kind. And yeah. so like the ineffectual adult leadership is such, I feel like a crucial part in of the slasher genre and, and uh, horror agreed. in general, because like, yeah, like it's, you're supposed to think like, Oh, I am a teenager. Who can I trust here? And like, you have to be the own of the own, like effectual leadership kind of thing. That's true. I think it, it it is thematic, but it did bother me because it's sure. like if you call the cops and hang up and say nothing, they yeah. will still show up in yeah. three minutes. Yeah. You know, you know, um, yeah. it's the 90s. That stuff was happening all the time. They would get calls like, <laughs> is your refrigerator running? <laughs> Better catch it. <laughs> <Catch pig>. it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Billy ends up. So the ghost face disappears. Billy climbs in through the window. So I guess that was Billy. He just took his costume off, dropped it outside. So everything they suspect him for and he is cleared of is what happened. That's what we all agree on, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Like the yeah. cell phone that fell. She's like, oh, my God. And I love that one of the biggest plot devices in this movie is that cell phones are rare and kind of shady. Yeah. Because the, the cop interviewing um, Billy in the next scene is like, what are you doing with a cellular telephone? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I was love like, it. yeah. What are you doing with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You're a kid. You shouldn't have one of those. What are you doing with that cellular telephone in your hooded sweatshirt? Only pieces of shit need yeah. cell phone. What are you playing, mm -hmm. Snake Billy, or are you killing? There's only two things you could be doing. Oh, I bet you go home and you play Mortal Kombat, don't you? <laughs> Vote Joe Lieberman. Lieberman. Sheriff Lieberman. <laughs> Vote Lieberman. Yeah. I like I when she opens the door. She gets scared because it's Ghostface, but mm -hmm. it's just Dewey. Like, oh, I found this. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was a good Man, shot. Man, David Arquette is like... 
perfectly cast here. Yes. But again, I can't stop thinking of Officer Doofus. <laughs> Sure. Told you not to bother me when I'm cleaning my room from Scary Movie yeah. every time I see him. But it really yeah. is not that far of a character no. from the Dewey character, which exactly. is what I love about it. Is they're just like, yeah, what if like the idiot deputy is kind of the smartest person in the town besides like the main character? You know, like, I love that about it. It's just like, here's this doofus. Yeah. And the usual suspects twist at the yeah, end. Yeah. Just like, oh, he's incredibly effective at his job. <laughs> Uh, so Loomis gets arrested, um, you know, and uh, it's we cut to Gail shitting on Kenny, the cameraman, like fat shaming him, body shaming him. Oh, yeah. Um, when I tell you to get your ass moving, you fucking get your ass moving. Move like, your lard ass over here. Which watching the subsequent uh, Scream iterations, um, not I don't think it spoils much to say that Gail is a one of the team, you know, throughout mm-hmm. the franchise. And yeah. it's really weird seeing her be like kind of such a piece of shit. Yeah. In the back to the beginning of her character. Um, capitalizing on Sydney's family grief, and you know, even though Writing she was ultimately it, I mean, right about not, Cotton Weary, I say I feel like it's not even until like much later in the franchise before she's even really like fully redeemed. I don't know that they redeem the character even so much as just mm-hmm. the nostalgia gets in the way, and you're yeah. like, oh, that's Gail. Yeah, I like that piece of shit. Oh, right? Yeah, uh, that's she's my still piece capitalizing of Capitalizing on trauma. Yeah, hey, man. Justice for Kenny. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah Kenny. He gets a raw deal he for does. sure. He's just doing his job eating he's, Cheetos. He gets he's the white his chips. Moment. Yeah. He went through, he, that, my boy crushed like three whole bags of chips. In well, that you're van. sitting in the van. What are you going to do? Right. That's, that's what I'm saying. Like, he's a legend. You love snacks. That'd be you. And yeah. his his dying uh, his dying words were to try to help a young woman. That's true. And he was going to go help a young man. After he's already had his throat slit, he was like, oh, there's a doggy door in this van for some reason. We haven't talked about it at all this I, whole movie, but it's there. People slide my chips through there. Mm-hmm. Usually. Yeah. Uh, How it works. <laughs> <laughs> um, he does litter though, so maybe that's why he had his come up. He died. I was pissed about that. Yeah. I was. Ghostface is an environmentalist. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's got that bag going to end up on a turtle and it's going to kill it. <laughs> Sydney can't find her dad, who is not at the hotel he told her, he made a point of telling her he'd be at, mm-hmm. which is a red herring because mm-hmm. it's they're trying to make. Uh, what's his name? Neil, he, Neil Prescott this suspicious. Point. Yeah. Not just to the cops, but to the audience, I feel yeah. like. I don't feel like even as a kid, I was ever convinced it was her dad. Yeah. No. Like, I, it just didn't occur I mean, to me. You gotta consider it. Like, I it's guess. One of, I think like, part like 78 pages into the script, like, I probably would have wondered if it's the dad first. Yeah. Like, Shit. Go back. All right, let's throw him out. Let's, you know. Make the hotel. Uh, anyway, Billy's being yeah. questioned. What are you doing with a cellular telephone? They end up taking Billy away. Um, the costume's a dead end as far as evidence. The father death costume is sold at every five and dime store in a five mile radius, which is only two of them, but still doesn't narrow it down. I just love how the, the sheriff still gets a kids these days moment. Like Taylor's on his time. Yeah. I know. I, I actually saying kids these days are the worst. Kids always suck. Yeah. yeah they're no always what, the worst. What era? The worst iteration of I wonder kids if they is thought always about now. that and like their uh, youth is wasted on them. Were yeah. they like that in like Elizabethan England though? Like kids these days. Oh yeah, you get those little poppers these days. Jam into their Beethovens and all their their rap songs. I was in the coal mine when I was five. Kids these days don't want to work. Like there's a proletariat <laughs> pushing a hoop with a stick. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. The whore. uh and they won't be able to check the cell phone records until morning and i didn't make a note of these kids today i didn't think it was possible but they they murder nowadays it's true i love the fact that tate so tatum is dewey's younger sister correct and he's he's trying to be like i'm a a big man at work i'm a i'm a a man of the law it's my superior mom told you to consider me a man of the law when i've got this uniform mom i love that dynamic of a little sister just just, shitting on just shitting all over her doofus, her doofus older brother who's yeah. tr- who's trying like i'm really trying to do my job please yeah, yeah. he's That's trying to fun. be a, like a person of authority and a person of respect but yeah. at the same time he's like licking a pink ice cream cone sure, you know? he's, still, yeah, he's still like that kid at heart you know yeah he's still a child it's a weird dialogue when gail Fee's first meets him and she's like you don't look a day older than 12 and he's like complimented yeah. <laughs> i don't like this but yeah, I, I love the line like, where he's like, that's my superior. And she's like, everybody's your superior, dude. Yeah, you yeah. suck. Got him. <laughs> Got him. Got him. Um, but her shitty taste in men will be her downfall. That yep. Tatum. Yep. So Gail uh, goes to look for them out back because they the sheriff lets them sneak out the back the back way of the police station because Tatum takes uh, Sydney home. But Gail's too clever for that. She's a savvy tabloid reporter. So she meets him in the alley with Kenny uh, and it's very rude to her. Right. Like. I'll send you a copy of the book about your dead mother, right? And she's just not backing down. So Sydney so punches her. F- it's so funny that I think it is rude, yes. 
But in Gail's eyes, she's not being. She's like, well, of course I'll send you a book. Of course. Like, she's like, yeah, we've, yeah. we've worked together on the <clears throat> writing of your mother's death. Like, in this weird way, Gail doesn't think she's being rude, but she totally is. She's antagonistic. She doesn't I quite, like, understand she, it. She, yeah. I think she knows what she did. I think she 100% put like, stank on that. Like, I'll send you a copy, bitch. Yeah, like, that, they're, was, they're, that was how I took oh, it. Oh, I thought it was more of like, of oh, course. Girl, of course I'm gonna send you a copy. We're partners in no, this. No, but I it was, love it your was definitely sweet more like, like I have capitalized on your grief yeah. and like I have consumerized and like written a story about like, you know, the stuff. And like basically Gail Weathers, I feel like is the reason Maureen Prescott's story won't go away. But is, also Gail is thinks Campbell Cotton wants. Weary is innocent. Yes. And he is. Yes. And so she kind of hates Sydney. Yes. Who is the biggest evidence. Putting him on death row, mm-hmm. right? Right. Yeah. Um, so she has less empathy for that reason. Tons. Yeah. And it's kind of funny. In retrospect, she's correct, you know? Yeah. So anyway, that's interesting. I never really thought about that till just now. I was like, actually, she's right. Even you though she's being mean about yeah. it. So uh, so I know, because I was looking up the- She's right. The, going about the I've never seen ways. the sequels, but I was looking up the cast, like, oh, like who are in these movies? Mm-hmm. Uh, Liv Schreiber, who plays Kyle Weary, yeah. mm-hmm. um, is he, he's not the when they cut away to like some news footage. It's a different actor, right? It's not. Him. No, it is. It, it's in, him in this movie. Yeah, it is? Leif Schreiber is oh, him shit. in that movie. But he's no, sitting in the squad car on the newsreel. It, so in this movie, in the newsreel, it's that it's him. Yes. Oh wow. Okay. He cool. just he looks like a fetus. <laughs> this is long before he played Sabretooth, <laughs> Wolverine's brother. I mean, that's when his career started. <laughs> right. No, actually, yeah, this is a, little, a yeah. few years before that. Um, so then uh, she gets a call from the killer. In Tatum and Dewey's house. And Dewey comes running in with a fucking gun, uh, which is fun. I mean, it's part of his character is like he's overcompensating. He's trying really hard. But it's like, what are you going to do, man? I love the comedic beat of the girls. Sydney's crying. She runs out. Everybody goes out of the room. It's just Dewey in there with his gun and his boxers. And he picks up the phone and goes, Hello? And then that, that's the end of the scene. Like, I think that's fucking great. Yeah. Like, did no one else laugh? Like, that's it's funny. Good, it's again, goes into Dewey kind of like over anxious, over eager, but still kind of like a minute too late. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's he's still, trying. Yeah. He, where it's he, just he, like, he, he gets there eventually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, then we get the first Nick Cave in the Bad Seeds uh, red, red hand needle drop. I love that song because I'm a huge Peaky Blinders fan. Mm-hmm. And I did. I didn't remember that it was in this movie so much. Mm-hmm. It's an all. Um, it's so good. It, boom, it, I think it stretches boom, 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 through all boom, boom. six. I bet you're right. Yeah, I think they use that in all six of them. Even though it was 20 years later, it will always be a Peaky Blinders song to me, yeah, damn it. No. You red, red hand. Time is a flat circle. Uh, <laughs> Cotton Weary's on the news. We see Billy's being released because the cell phone records did not indicate that he had called anybody. And she got the call while he was in jail. Uh, so it's like, oh, it can't be him because I got a, a call from a killer. Mm-hmm. Uh, she goes to talk to Gail at the school. Like Sydney approaches Gail the next day at the school. She's like, no, I'm not going to punch you. I just want to talk. Uh, and so we find out that uh, Gail thinks Cotton is innocent, like we were talking about. Uh, people are running through the hall as Ghostface in costume, like just fucking with people, which is really insensitive. Very. And the Fonz is going to be pissed off about that later. So but I mad. feel like very accurate for 90s teenagers. For Or even today, teenagers, yeah, teenagers are terrible period. people. Yeah, yeah, maybe. They're terrible I don't know. People. I'm trying to give people a little bit more benefit of the doubt. And I'm like, more, did you like, see a September 12th? Air. Do you remember when everybody was dressed up like airplanes running I through the halls? I didn't remember because I swear I'd never forget. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, it happened. It was, it's true. It happened. They Somewhere were, it happened. They were flapping their arms. Somewhere and, it happened. <laughs> uh, Sid apologizes to Billy, which is gross. Uh, and then he takes that opportunity to be like, I do think it's time you get over it. You know, your mom died a year ago. Like my mom left. Like my parents got divorced. We're the same. Love and I'm that. not being a little bitch about it, even though I'm literally murdering people. So there's, there's one bit about this when, uh, cause it's Billy saying I could have made that call. I was in jail and I laughed so hard because the way he punctuates, like I was in jail was he holds up his hands to see that it show that he had been fingerprinted. So it's like, oh, I haven't washed. I haven't taken a shower yet. <laughs> like that made me laugh so hard. It was just such a, I, it could have been me. I was in jail. <laughs> the, the ink sometimes won't come off, you know, or something. It was just kind of a funny, it just was funny. But he makes a good point with the ink on his fingers. So we cut to Henry Winkler expelling the pranksters, right? He's just so furious that they were dressed up like ghost face. He's like, oh, you guys think that's funny? You know what's not funny? Uh, your entire lives being ruined. How about that? How about you just go be criminals? 
because you're clearly already going to be criminals because <laughs> fuck you. And it's your parents fault. There must be terrible people. Like he just lays into them. you desensitized little shits. <laughs> right? Yeah, he's not wrong. Like we can't stand up. Sure. We got to stand up to bullies. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate a principal like that, even if he did wield. And it wasn't even like like. Like the kind of scissors that are kind of safe. Like those are the fuck you scissors. Like back in the day, the heavy like ones. like these like times three. Yeah. Right? Like, you know what I'm talking about? The, like the hard, like the, the metal scissors. handle ones. Yeah. They yeah. cut fabric and art oh, so he's class. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's ready to go. Um, and then we, we get a scene where Sydney hears girls being super mean, talking hella shit in the bathroom. Yeah. She's a slut like her mother. And I wrote, Jesus, <laughs> I know <laughs> like, that is wild. What, what, the, the, the 40 year old woman they got to play this cheerleader is, is, new, <laughs> is, is making some choices. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> like uh, I was so distracted by like her eye line. Cause they're, so they're looking in the mirror. She's talking to another girl, but they're supposed to be looking in the mirror, but her eye lines like a skewed, like looking down. So I was the whole time like, what is she fucking looking at? She saw like driving a, me there's nuts. a spider on the ground. I was saying, it just hard cuts to a caterpillar going across yeah. the sink. Like, and it's like Terrence Malick, like <laughs> artist, artistic vision. That'd be amazing. <laughs> yeah. She's calling someone's mother a slut whilst being distracted by a caterpillar. <laughs> the wall, the caterpillar uh. will cocoon itself and emerge a beautiful new thing like quite a, you know. i like to think she was trying to remember if she flushed and she left like a hog yeah. in there and yeah. was like mm, doesn't matter hey she gotta clean that out nobody, she's doing cheerleader practice later nobody right. knows it was me um and then sydney's in there alone and then she hears someone whispering sydney sydney Candyman. 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 There's some Candyman action in this scene mm. Uh, and then she gets tacked again in the bathroom and i guess it's supposed to be like was that really a killer or just another prankster Mm-hmm. She's like, no, it's definitely killer. So uh, this scene is there a is there supposed to be a red herring where the the sheriff is the killer because they make a point in this scene to show the boots come down in the stall and then later on they make a point the to show stomp of the boots. they show the sheriff's boots he has like the same type of boots. I didn't even catch that but yeah, you're hundred percent probably right yeah that makes okay. sense to me that they would be throwing you off all over the place because the killer being the sheriff would be a good twist yeah, yeah. Um, do we <laughs> stay close to Sydney. Um, and we cut to Gail Weathers probing Dewey for information. He's a terrible flirt, mm-hmm. but she kind of be slowly becomes smitten by his lack of charm. Mm-hmm. Like, like legitimately does kind of fall I for him. I couldn't tell if she was the, uh, I think it starts off as she's just yeah. using him. Yeah. But then by the end of it, I'm like, I don't really she's believe like, they, she's like, she has been swayed by his bumpkin. I kind of want to fuck this guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know? it's, it's the stash. It, it is a bottomless barrel of charm. That Are Dewey. you giving out rides on that thing? I'm just curious. That's what she's thinking. Um, and Kennedy, Zaddy. Kenny too. Kenny's like, I want, I'd go. What's up, man? Yeah. Uh, you I like Cheetos? Chips. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you crawl through this back door in my van here? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm sure you my first. equipment. All the classes are suspended until further notice because of the attack at the school, or at least um, the goings on in general. They institute a nine o'clock curfew in this town to combat the killings which even the police don't take seriously. And we'll find that out soon enough. Um, and then they talk about uh, Sydney has a, or not Sydney, Gail has a line where she's talking to Dewey and she, he's like, oh, it's not a serial killer yet. Got to kill a few more to qualify for that, you know, nomenclature. And she's like, we can hope. Uh, <laughs> Further cementing sure. the fact she wants hey. her own reputation to be bolstered yeah. more than anything else. If it else. bleeds, it leads, all right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, also, her biggest demographic is 11 to 24. He's 25. Mm-hmm. And then he's like, I was 24 for a whole year, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is fun. I like yeah, that. I like, it's a good line. That's yeah. a funny line. Stu wants to throw a party. And the Dewey, a cop, is going to drop his sister and her friend off at this party past curfew and think nothing of it. I think that's fun. But to Alex's point, that's Dewey, baby, not only that, Maybe, but the police in general in these movies sure. are just completely Maybe incompetent. Dewey's thinking like there's no safer place she can be than a party with a bunch friends. of people. Yeah. 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 I can, I can see that logic sure. leap. One of whom is the killer. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe two. Um, we cut to the principal trying on the ghost face mask. Uh, you know, he just wants to see what it's like. I was yeah. saying, is that that part of me is like, OK, that kind of loosely tackles uh, like the fetishization of it sure. too, because he wants to put it on, put the mask on, hold the sharp scissors, whatever, see how it feels, you know, yeah. to yeah. put yourself in the skin of the killer. Kind sure. Of thing. I, he probably wants to kill all the kids too. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, <laughs> yeah. get mad enough. But At I that think point. That, that's one thing that we hadn't touched on that I think this franchise does well too, is it kind of gets into the fetishism of like the serial killers and stuff like that. 
Yeah, but, the Netflix docs, the yeah. investigation discovery, that kind of stuff. The, the the boom that it has occurred since then. Yeah, and we get a spooky knock at the door. Uh, Fred the janitor is prickly. He is not having it. I love this. What? Night shift is starting. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then he gets stabbed as fuck by the ghost face killer after some knocky knocks, uh, which is there's no real reason to kill the principal other than to throw, yeah, ba- throw based, you off the trail. I based guess off what happens at the end, I'm kind of like, uh, what is the reason for killing the people that were killed? Other, but then they say like, there is no reason. So yeah, this is the millennium. Yeah, yeah. No need for a motive. I like that. <laughs> Big word. Uh, and then we get to Tatum and Sydney talking about how maybe Cotton is innocent. Like Tatum's kind of, uh, maybe you got a point. Maybe the guy who killed your mom didn't kill your mom. You ever think about that? I'm a good friend. Um, we get a Richard Gere gerbil story. It's like the Richard Gere, Gere gerbil story. You know, you hear it enough, you just start to believe it. Uh, I haven't heard about that since the 90s, so it's like that's so funny. Like he just kind of like whew, finally let Shrek. that go. And now it's immortalized in a movie. Cool. He escaped it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We also get a Wes Carpenter flick if joke. If you don't know what that story is, it's funny. Tell it, Steve. I don't want to tell it. But go look it up. <laughs> yeah, Google Richard Gere gerbil. Yeah. <laughs> and have a good time. Um, I like the Wes Carpenter joke. Uh, we cut to Randy and Stu at a video store. I oh, love a good scene at a video sorry, store. This, this was the scene where they're talking on the, the porch. And when they leave, the camera just slowly kind of dollies towards the, the woods. And then you just see ghost. Oh, that's like, what you, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you see him. <laughs> In the trees, yeah. <laughs> so funny. And then at the video store, uh, we see Randy telling Stu that Billy's probably the killer because he's he, he's got horror movies figured out. He's a huge fan. Stu, yeah, yeah. There's always a reason to kill your girlfriend. And the girl in the background is like, what? <laughs> I think it's a great scene. Some stupid bullshit reason to kill your girlfriend. Yeah. Uh, and then Randy's ac- accusing Billy, who's right over there. It's like, oh, I can't believe he's standing in the horror section. It's so gauche. Um, and there's a prom night reference. Uh, the dad's a red herring. It's Billy. And He's then Billy's so behind mad. him. Yeah, Billy's like upset. Well, Randy gets offended, so mad because he, he starts screaming in the store about like the horror movie rules and everyone's He's passionate. At him. He's one of them yeah. nerd guys. He loves movies. Yeah, yeah. he does. Randy, Randy would definitely He's have a podcast. Oh, oh, my God. Yeah. A thousand percent. <laughs> yeah. Him and uh, Is Ghostface. Is he in the other movies? Randy uh, is Randy? at least through the second one. Okay. All right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I'll Mm -hmm. skip that one. (laughs) I can't believe you don't like Randy. As a kid. I just don't like I loved Randy. (laughs) Separate the art from the artist. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, uh, and then we get the millennium joke. And then everybody's closing up for curfew throughout the town. There's like a a montage-ish thing of everybody closing up. I love the closing up scene because it's maybe... 2 p.m. based off the shadows right. that are on the ground. And everyone's <laughs> like, it's night's coming up soon. Man. Uh, it's Run home, a, child. The sun will be down soon. It's such a black hat coming through the Western town montage, yeah, right? Where like you've seen the saloon close the yeah. doors, people like shutting the windows, you know, and stuff like that. I love that. It's such a nice yeah. little just like. This is like, I like to imagine it's almost high summer and like it doesn't get dark till like 1030. <laughs> right. right. That's all. But uh, yeah, it's, I'm well. It's just like it downtown Cincinnati where seven. everything closes at five. We know Based on the shadows on the ground, what are you, a fucking groundhog? No, I I shoot <laughs> things for a living. Oh, that's There's true. no way this movie could take place in the fall. There's always a 70% chance of rain going on. Yeah. Come on, man. Look at the leaves. Shadows are my job, Chris. What are you, a groundhog? <laughs> that was my real name is Punkstakani. <laughs> my best friend is Phil. I live in Gobbler's Knob. <laughs> We get another. You want to come see my knob? <laughs> oh, if I can gobble or something. God damn it. <laughs> we get Anyways. another Nick Cave drop. Uh, and then we cut to Dewey, Tatum, and Sid. They're shopping for snacks for the party. Yeah. Uh, Sydney is starting to be successfully gaslit. She's like, ah, oh, Billy, I haven't helped him come in a long time. It's true. I've been sexually anorexic. Like, <laughs> it's such a. So uncomfy. Um, and then there's that scene between Dewey and the sheriff where he's smoking a ciggy. We get the boot Dewey's shot. Dewey's got his ice cream. Yeah, Dewey's <laughs> licking his cone. I thought the sheriff's like, what are you doing, Dewey? Keeping an eye on Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, sure. Uh, well, the calls were listed to Neil Prescott. So Ooh. Billy's clear. So now it's like they're really harping on the fact that dad might be the killer. Yeah, because uh, only like, like you said, only like six people own cell phones at this point. So it's easy to triangulate yeah. calls, I the, guess. The next shot is where... Uh, Kenny, the news guy, the cameraman, litters, which is very upsetting. He just throws a whole bag of chips out the window. Die. 
Dewey's not taking the curfew very seriously. He just drops everybody off at the house. Like, have fun, underage drinking, guys. Woo. Woo. I'm going to go try to fuck the reporter. And it's Stu's well, plan, house. His plan. He's going to try and weathers the storm. Come on. Ooh. Ooh. So Dewey doesn't know Gail's there. Is his original plan to, you know, like we said, safety in numbers, let him hang out with their friends. But also he's going to kind of just linger. Yeah, he's just going to stay outside. Yeah, okay. But just, I'm not going to ruin the fun by being the cop in the party. Right. If Gail wasn't there, maybe he would have been more successful at catching the killer, maybe? For sure. Yeah. For but sure. He got a big distra- distraction because Dewey's thinking with his dick. Yeah. yeah. He was 24 for a whole year. Old yeah. Dewey dicks out. A whole year. And it, he was horny that whole year. Yeah. And he's still recovering from that. You want to see my target demo? <laughs> <laughs> my socks. Um, <laughs> Dewey spots Gail and Kenny. Immediately gets excited. Goes over there. Uh, we get some references inside. I'm going to try to move a little quicker. I know we're an hour and a half in here. Uh, we get some references to Jamie Lee Curtis, the scream queen. One of the most iconic scenes in this movie is coming up with Randy discussing the rules of mm-hmm. horror films. Um, Dewey brings Gail into the party. Could not be a worse idea and more inappropriate to 25 to 28 year olds just drinking with 17 year olds. Um, Gail stashes a camera in the living room and which is good tech for the late nineties. Right. Like, a, yeah. yeah, they got a good feed off that. Yeah. yeah. It's like wireless too. Like, I guess, I guess that was a thing, but wild. Um, Tatum goes to the garage to grab some drinks for Stu. Stu asked for a beer, right? Yeah. So Stu told her to go in there. He's like, give me a drink, woman. And she makes a joke about it, like, ha, 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 I'll make you a sandwich, right too. Yeah. Yeah. Someone else He's like, I'm right going to kill you. I'm going to have my buddy kill you. Something like that. Um, I think it's a fun thing to imagine which one is which, like you said mm-hmm. earlier. And I guess it's Billy in the scene because Stu is so visible in the sure. living room. Yeah. Um, and the, we get the old cat knocked over the shovels move. Classic. Classic. <laughs> Cats are always scary. Yeah. Save the cat. Uh, we get an I spit on your grave reference. Uh, and then she gets stuck in the cat door. <laughs> now, hey, I want to I want to point out the obvious. <laughs> Who made that garage door? This is a great kill. But at the same time, if you've ever seen a garage door, <laughs> th- there's so many safety mechanisms and they would never be strong enough to lift a body. There's so many things wrong with this, the right? The spring pops and just impales ghost face. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's the end of the movie. It like, would yeah. Amazing, yeah. I'm done by the most dangerous thing in your house. I like that they show it struggling, though. But like, yeah. you know, you just wave your hand under the sensor and it stops moving. You know, it's over. And it, what, it like breaks her neck, right? Like it slowly raises her yeah. up to the yeah. end and then it's like squishes <laughs> her. Like, it, like no garage door has that force, even if it could lift her up. But this scene is so fucking funny just because A, the kill is so ridiculous. And B, again, Ghostface is just, it, Ghostface is basically like Melissa McCarthy in any movie, just falling all over the place. <laughs> well, she beats the Whoop. shit out of him. Yeah, she's like throwing beer yeah. at him. Hits him and with the garage door. He always has a hard time. Yeah. Because yeah. they, well, they're kids. Right? And that's that's kind of the big exactly. thing. Exactly. They're not competent yeah. killers. Just two yeah. teenagers that like why movies. why you picked them for your team, I have no idea. But the icon. I, th- I think they got like a mime or somebody to actually be in the suit because the pratfalls are deliciously funny. <laughs> like at, like feet up in the air, ass yeah. down. Ooh, like put face it Face down, ass up. Yeah, face down, ass up. <laughs> Body yaddy, yaddy, yaddy. Yaddy, 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 yaddy. <laughs> That's how Ghostface does it. That's right. That's right. Uh, Billy shows up as everybody's leaving the party. And again, you guys remember parties, right? There's a party after the party. Sure. All remember, the casuals were kicked uh, out. I remember still... not getting invited to them. <laughs> 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 it's okay, buddy. Now you got this sweet podcast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now you can eat your cake and shit it out later like a normal movement. <laughs> um, and then Stu says they can go talk in his parents' room. Hey, why don't you go fuck in my mom and dad's bed? Really weird, S- Stu. Subtly, Stu. Um, uh, Billy apologizes, quote unquote, in this discussion with Sydney. Uh, and there's more meta commentary. It's all a movie. One great big movie. Uh, she's like, I wish it was a Meg Ryan movie or a porno. A good porno. And he's like, what? what? They, they fucking porns. <laughs> Oh, yeah, they do. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> and he's like, oh, OK. Uh, right. We cut we intercut between the sex and Randy talking about the rules in this scene. They're watching a horror movie starring Jamie Lee Curtis, the Scream Queen. Um, and the, um, you, are you going to interrupt now or no? Keep going. He discusses the three rules to surviving a horror movie. One, never have sex. Boom. Two, related to one, you can never drink or do drugs. And three, Never say, I'll be right back. That will ensure that you're not going to come right back. 
at this point, Stu leaves and says, I'll be right back. Right. <laughs> Which was one of my favorite lines as a kid. I just, I used to do that all the time. That, like, I can remember like fifth grade just mm-hmm. going, I feel a little woozy. Like, I didn't even understand what that meant. <laughs> yeah. Like blood loss. None of that was sure. occurring to me. I just like the way that he said it. Yeah. Good um, delivery. Uh, so this is the thing that I wanted to ask. So from here and then a couple other scenes, they keep cutting to Jamie Kennedy on the couch talking about the movie. Yes. People keep getting up and walking in the back. And I couldn't, for, as I was watching this in real time, I was like, oh, are people like walking in the back and being murdered and no one's just realizing? Obviously, we know what happens to Stu, but there are several other people who walk and just go away. Are they just leaving? Yes. Are just leaving the party? Yeah. Okay. All right. I think, yeah. There's only there was, like five people left with and Stu and Billy and Randy. Okay. And then Gail and Kennedy are like super not hiding out, out front. <laughs> like they're literally right in front of the house in this news van. Yeah. And Ken, Kenny's always like, huh? Oh, they see us. Close the door. Um, but I get it. Kids don't care. They're just drunk and shit. Um, so yeah, it, we also get this scene is intercut mostly with the sex with Sydney and Billy and Randy discussing the rules, but there's also a the reminder humping. that <laughs> yes. A lot of dry humping. Gail's watching the delayed video and stuff as well. Mm. Um, so we're reminded of the delay and I like how we see what's going on. And then in the news van, they're like watching what just happened yeah. just to remind you how that works. Uh, Dewey interrupts to have Gail check out a suspicious car with him, which is a terrible police idea, right? <laughs> she got a call about a sp- suspicious car. You want to want to walk down? I think it's a nice night. I got a flashlight. <laughs> what a gentleman. <laughs> and I, I love the line. Do you know what that constellation is? <laughs> no, what is it? No, I was hoping you know. That's why I asked. <laughs> That's so Such a great encapsulation. And then everyone's leaving the party. Billy's groping and dry humping, yep. which is what Steve pointed yep. out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we got Jamie narrating kind of what's going on in our own movie. And we get the obligatory tit shot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Randy gets a call that Principal Henry's dead. Strung up on the goalposts. And the guys all leave like, oh, I want to see that. Right. Who are these people? <laughs> They're so terrible. Who are these people? They're so excited about the death of someone that they do donuts out of their friend's fucking house and almost run a cop over. Oh, my right. God. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, like, it just it, again, caps like really captures that sort of like rebellious state of the 90s. Yeah. Like, I think it does that so well again. And, one of the positives of it. And there's always like extra shitty teenagers. Yeah. Like, like teen bullies in these old movies were like psychopathic. Yeah. Right. And I, yeah. I think Wes is just like, fuck it. And these people aren't even the murderers. They're just no. normal They're fucking just students. irredeemable <laughs> fox. <laughs> these are normal students. These are your normal people in this town. Yeah. Uh, so they head out. And then we find out Dewey's real name is Dwight. He finds Dewey to be kind of uh, an embarrassing iteration of his name meant to demean him. Mm-hmm. And Gail's like, I think it's sexy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I wrote that in all caps. Gail thinks the name Dewey mm. is sexy. It's kind of sexier than Dwight. I'll give her that. Sexier than Huey or Louie. That's right. Or the Newies. You take that back. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, Huey's a king. <laughs> they almost run Dewey over. Gail kisses him. His response to the kiss is, I'm on duty. <laughs> yeah, she, she laughs th- at him. Yeah. And then she <laughs> this says, is so bad. is this what you were looking for? And he's like, all my life. <laughs> my whole life. <laughs> all 17 years, maybe 18 of it. No, it's Neil Prescott's car. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, so he freaks out. But he walks down there in his horniness so he can't drive back up. It's a good way to get rid of the cop and the reporter. Yeah. Um, we cut to uh, Billy and Sydney are already done fucking. Post dry hump. Which, well, they, they've stopped dry humping now. I but I can't imagine he got it. I mean, we're talking. We know at what point he was in the movie, like Randy. Sure. Like this is maybe a minute and a half has yeah. gone by. Yeah. Dude's already not only busted, but is like a way away from her getting dressed. Well, how was that for you? <laughs> yeah, no, no wonder she's so it's like, right? it's like, and then he's like, you OK? <laughs> and I started dying laughing because we've all been there. <laughs> I swear that doesn't usually happen. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was just cleaning it and it went off. <laughs> <laughs> and then she starts to get kind of suspicious because if there's anything that's going to make you suspicious of your lover, it's unsatisfying sex, right? Like she certainly yeah. hasn't had an orgasm. Oh. So now she's thinking of all the petty things she can S- think of. Someone would, who isn't a murderer would have pleasured me. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, who did you call? Yeah. You got one phone call. Everybody knows that from movies. Who'd you call? Oh, my dad. And she knows that he didn't call his dad. So she starts to become suspicious that maybe... So this is trying to trick the audience again, like, oh, Billy is the killer, even though somebody called from while he was in jail, it could have still been him. Mm-hmm. And right as you're convinced it's Billy because he's being super sus, what do I have to do to convince you I'm not a killer? The killer stabs Billy for subversion. She runs, climbs on the roof, 
ends up falling off the roof into a boat, luckily. Uh, that's where she sees Tatum dead Thank hanging God from the garage. Was there. Thank yeah. God. I love the scene where she looks up at the roof and is like, where'd he go? It's like, he was only half out of the window. He just went back inside. Yeah. Uh, Cause it's the, the music makes it look like uh, he's right. gone. Yeah. Uh, she sees Tatum dead hanging from the garage. Finally, someone finally saw Tatum's dead body. Mm. Nobody Everyone's wants to- walking around their property. <laughs> There's all these people drinking and going to get booze. They no didn't have motion activated floodlights at the uh, at the top of the garage door mm-hmm. to set it off. It's just she's just in the shadows. Well, all the power went off in the garage when she go. yeah she broke it somehow. It. Uh, <laughs> um, and then we get the scene where, where Jamie Kennedy is screaming, "Watch out, Jamie!" <laughs> to Jamie Lee Curtis, look yeah. behind you. Yeah, I find that tickles me. I love personally. that spot. Um, I, I put LOL. Get it? That is funny. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> Kenny forgets about the delay and goes to try to warn uh, Randy and gets his throat slit because the killer's already outside standing by the van by the time that he sees what's going on inside the house. I, I love this meta comment. This is like my favorite part of the meta-ness that this movie is. It's like he's actively watching. Watching a TV, yeah. Like, watch out behind you and the killer's behind him. And at the same time, they're watching a delay like, kid, look out behind you. Yeah. But it's on a 30-second delay. I really like the 30 second delay framing that that, that was cool because then he's like he's already there able to like stab Kenny. Plus there's like three movies going like we're watching Kenny watch a movie where the guy's watching a movie. Yeah. Right. Kind of. Yeah. It's cool. Mm-hmm. All right. I like it. Uh, layers. Layers like an ogre. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Or parfait. Kenny gets a throat slit uses his last remaining breath to to warn the young lady where the back door in the van is. Justice for Kenny. That's right. Kenny's a, a saint. A little slow in the draw with the camera, maybe. But that's would, his only flaw. His only flaw is that he letters. letters. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That's a big one. Um, there is. So she crawls out the back door of the van. Dewey finally shows up. He acts like a complete goober in the house. Like, <laughs> like all of his training is coming to bear. He's watched. He's watched <laughs> Die Hard several times. Yeah. He's super nervous. Scared of the horror movie that's going on. Uh, Gail notices that Kenny's gone. She sees a pool of blood because he tells her to call the cops while he's in the house. Um. She ends up beating the fuck out of Randy with her phone when he shows up to the window. And that poor guy, he didn't do shit wrong. I just like movies, man. Right. Uh, <laughs> when do my friends leave? I guess they put Kenny on the roof to hide the body because like there's like blood on the windshield wipers and he slides under the windshield. So good. She feels bad about slinging his body off the van. And then she almost runs Sydney over and ends up wrecking the van into a tree. OK, this is this wreck is 100 percent Sydney's fault, right? <laughs> Yeah, she didn't have to, like, well, she didn't want to be left behind. Hi, I'm in the middle of the road. And, ah, oh, man. Well, if she hadn't been standing there, let me posit this to you. Okay, posit. Let me walk you through posit, this. Baby. I, love I get what you're it. saying. She doesn't stand in the middle of the road. She, she stands to the side of the road safely. Yeah. Gail, in her panicked, selfish rush, who <laughs> drives right past her and leaves. Sydney dies, because Gail's the one that saves the day. Sure. Right? But mm-hmm. also... Maybe Gail does stop. Like eventually she might like slow down and let her pack get up because she's made space. But now your mode of transportation's gone because you just almost killed Gail. If she's panicking that much to where she almost ran Sydney over, she's definitely not slowing down to pick up the chick on the side of the I road. What if Sydney was tied to the tracks and the trolley was coming? <laughs> <laughs> Is this the trolley problem? The Sydney problem? Oh my God. Uh so Sydney runs back up to the house. Dewey has a knife in his back when he comes out. Um she and two ghost face, ghost face. Yeah, <laughs> and two, and two ghost face. <laughs> <laughs> I broke Alex. <laughs> she ends up locking herself in the cruiser. She plays a little game with ghost face because he's got the keys, so she keeps locking the doors as he's like crawling under the car and unlocking each door. He ends up coming he's in having the a back. Great time. Classic move. He's having a fun time. She radios into the cops. The second call to the police that's ineffectual. Uh, and then ends up running from the car into the house. Randy and Stu both show up. She says, fuck you both, which I thought was a great scene because you think to yourself, this is a horror movie. They use dumb logic. She's going to trust one of them. It's going to be the wrong one. Mm-hmm. But satisfyingly, she does the smart thing. It says, fuck you both and slams <laughs> yeah. the door and locks the door. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then Billy comes falling down the stairs. Meh, Again, I, hilarious stunt people. It's so funny watching uh, him tumble all those stairs. You haven't noticed that even though I'm bloody, there's no holes in my shirt. Give me the gun. Uh, which I get. It probably looks like a mess. Uh, so he takes the gun from her and then obviously quotes Psycho like you do. We all go a little mad sometimes and shoots poor Randy. 
poor Randy. And we get the famous corn syrup, just like Carrie. <laughs> and then Stu comes in. He's part of it too. The big reveal. Yeah. The killer. They're both the killer. They're using a voice changer. Um, and then we get the whole climax. I'm rushing through a very important part of the movie. Stop me if there's anything you want to talk about. But they admit to framing Cotton Weary. They're the ones that killed her mother. Mm-hmm. So, Billy's only motive is he was mad that her mom split up his marriage, her, his parents' marriage. <laughs> Stu has no motive. He's just like peer pressure. He's just there yeah. for a good time. Yeah, he gets a raw deal. Uh-huh. Um, and then Stu comes back in at some point with her dad. So their whole master plan is to frame her father into being the killer. Yeah, they stab clone each cellular, other. Yeah. As you do. Yeah, clone a cellular, bro. Yeah. Easy yeah. to do back then. And then they stab each other. <laughs> right. They do step. That's a good scene too, because they yeah. weaken themselves. Because again, it works because they're they're dumb kids who just are obsessed with movies, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what their plan was because he's all tied up and stuff. He's not going to look. It was like going to be obviously they're going to cut him free after they kill him. Yeah, I guess it was something where it was going to the whole frame. But detective was, wise, there's going to be like duct tape residue. They're and dumb stuff. kids, yeah. But yeah. like it's it's the idea would be to frame Neil not only for like their two stabbings but also the murders in woodsboro what would be the murder of nev campbell as well as uh maureen's yeah. murders what well, would be framed neil for everything yeah. even though they'd already the, framed cotton yeah, weary because it's the anniversary of her murder yeah as well yeah. yes so he would be retroactively yeah. pinged for the murder and of maureen was, yeah maureen had a sordid or unsorted affair with billy's dad right and that's why he was like you broke up my family yes yeah okay the movie's very clear. Maureen did, in fact, mm-hmm. that's canon, mm-hmm. like to fuck. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's just how am I, you, you know, if you judge her for that, that's I'm on you. i saying let Maureen be Maureen. That's right. right. Maybe none of your business. Let people fuck. Been trying to say this. Been trying to say it. They stab each other. We get the giant don't blame the movies line, which I love. Uh, take that, Lieberman. Uh, and then <laughs> Stu can't find the gun. He just sat down. Gail has it. But wait, the safety's on. Knocks her out. He's about to shoot Sid, uh, Gail. But then they realize Sydney's gone. And Stu keeps allowing this shit to happen because he's woozy. Because Billy's a dick and stabs him three times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, she calls them with the voice changer, which I love. I don't always love that she put took the time to dress like Ghostface. <laughs> so dumb. But there's some retribution to it. You know, Batman painted the logo on the building and set it on fire before he saved Gotham from Bane. These things happen. <laughs> like, it's, you just got to kind of, like, let things slide. Batman's a fascist. Yeah. I was a, Sydney needed to be a symbol. I watched Blue Beetle yesterday, and Batman's there's a line a fascist, where he screams, yeah. Batman's a fascist, yeah. which I thought was funny. Um, that, that line's in the trailer. It made me laugh every time I saw the trailer <laughs> in the movie. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It makes me feel better. Uh, and this is where Stu admits to peer pressure being his motive. Um, my dad's going to be so mad. Uh, she so stabs good. him with an umbrella dressed as Ghostface, uh, and then TV electrocutes Stu, like drops the TV on his Dumbest face. Dumbest fucking death ever. No, it's great. Really, the uh, movies killed Stu. She didn't open the umbrella after she stabbed him, right? No. See, that's where you make it the dumbest death or dumbest kill in the whole movie. You stab someone, then you open the umbrella for fun. But yeah, that's what you do. Yeah. Has Mortal Kombat taught us nothing? Right. Penguin, where? I just, I just thought I was laughing so hard because, like, I like the the poetry of TV killing Stu. Mm-hmm. Yeah, here for it. The fact that a tube TV just carefully fell over a foot on top of him, and his hands are up to catch it, and then it bursts and electrocutes him. Those tube TVs are heavy. <laughs> I actually, I would buy. It. Maybe not the elect. Actually, yeah, they're highly electric. Like, uh, they actually. I'm gonna I'm gonna counter that. I think it's the most realistic death in the movie. <laughs> okay, those tube TVs were <laughs> fucking super heavy. They're not. I'm just saying, if he was, and my like, dad used to say, because I used to take them apart and stuff, he used to say to be careful. Those tube TVs will actually hold electricity long after they're unplugged. Okay, my point is, so I'm, a, I'm buying it now. My point is that maybe if Stu fell over and was like out of it and loopy and maybe unconscious, and then it just fell on him. Cool. But the fact that he put his hands up and then just, eh, just, just I mean, it little, still would have stabbed his if face. If it had fallen from like the second floor onto him. Yeah. But from like, the, no, that's not going to mm. fucking kill him. What anybody. was that, like a 32 inch though? Uh, yeah, I'd say a 32. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I don't know. 32 is on the fence. I was trying to see if anybody's made any sort of like science of scream. 27 wouldn't is, there, is there a yeah. Mythbusters episode? There isn't. There a 27 oh, wouldn't have done it, but a 32, I'm not, I don't know. I'm sold. And you get one of those nine inches with a VCR built in. Ooh, okay, That's those are heavy. deadly. 
<laughs> Gets his hands caught in the face. <laughs> oh no, it's rewinding! <laughs> Like pulls him in. <laughs> it actually undoes all of the murders he's done. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good Very idea. Meta. Time scream. <laughs> this is time scream. Randy pops up, says he's never been so grateful to be a virgin in his life. What's your favorite time paradox movie? <laughs> About time. Donald Gleason, Rachel McAdams. It's great. Uh, Stu comes back, but or it's Billy, right? Billy comes back, gets yeah. shot by yeah. Gail. Um, and that's where Randy points out, yeah, be careful. This is the time when the killer, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the killer comes back to life. Yeah. And he does, but I love how he telegraphs the scare. So it doesn't scare you. Yeah. And they just shoot him and it's funny. But then the dad pops out of the closet and, and serves that purpose anyway sure. with like a noise, a jump scare. Yeah. I loved it. I think that's genius. Randy's um, very happy to be a virgin. Mm -hmm. He is. Mm -hmm. And then the movie ends. Gail gets her story. Uh, seems to be a happy ending, unlike most scary movies. Sure. Uh, it seems to be all good. We it, know that there's five more movies, and it's not, but it seems to be all good in this yeah, first iteration. Yeah, all's well that ends well. Yeah. And yeah. It, avo it avoids the one thing I think all horror movie endings struggle to avoid, and that is the Dewey Sex Machina. The Dewey's Ex Machina? Uh, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Love it. But yeah, no, I... uh. I, I, hate when I, I hate it when I'm watching uh, Friday the 13th and Dewey shows up at the end and saves everybody. Every time. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> like David Arquette getting work, but God damn, yeah. at what cost? Uh, so that's it, guys. That's Scream. Thank you, Matthew, Scream. for your suggestion, Thank your you. your mandate. Uh, really good to read. I had a 4K steel book that I haven't cracked open yet until last night. So nice. I was able to, to, yeah. to crack that, baby. To have, uh, to but now I want to watch two, three, four, five, and six again. Yeah. I w yeah. I, yeah. I, I I was this I haven't seen two three four was, for a while I during think. during our break I was telling I think you were out of the room Alex but I was telling uh, Kit that I was looking at like the cast for all the other ones I'm yeah like, man Scream Four that's a stacked fucking cast yeah I kind of want to watch that I I really liked four I'd put four as the second one people like, love four four five and six are super interchangeable for me but it probably be like one four six five two three. I think five it. and six are like surprisingly good. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of Melissa Barrera and Jenna I, Ortega. I think the, the and subway, Jasmine Savoy Brown, the subway train sequence in six is like one of the best in the entire franchise and the marketing. Yeah. Yeah. Cause imagine it's basically Ghostface takes New York is yeah. six. Yeah. Um, which is neat. It's just a neat idea. Um, and they play with the whole idea in, in the same way that this, this movie satirizes slashers like five and six satirize scream. Like it gets meta on meta. Mm -hmm. It gets meta on legacy sequels. And you know, there's, there's one joke in four that I love so much. It's Hayden Panettiere on the phone and Ghostface is like, name this popular horror remake. And then like he, she cuts him off at the question, like right there and just rattles off like 32 remakes that had been made between like scream and scream four. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, holy shit, like that was genius. Cause then he just doesn't answer and she goes, that had to have been it. Yeah. Like, I had to have gotten it. <laughs> like, I'm just like, yes. Like this is so good. Yeah. So people love four. Highly recommended, Steve. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, don't forget to go to patreon.com slash streaming things for bonus content, all kinds of cool, extra fun stuff. Rate mm. and review the show. Email us at streamingthingspod at gmail.com. Or just go to streamingthingspod.com and find uh, all of our stuff collected there. We love you so much. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. My name is Kit. I'm Alex, and you and should watch Nightmare on Elm Street 3. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm Steve. <laughs> and this was Streaming Things. Happy streaming. Do you like scary movies? <laughs> Let's watch them. Let's watch them. Get in here, girl. Make that popcorn. Do you like sci-fi movies? <laughs> Do you like sci-fi movies? <laughs> oh, don't you like a fish? <laughs> <laughs> Bitch. <laughs>